pressure. Can you give it? Can you take it? Can you feel it? Playoff baseball. Barry Bonds and the Giants drew first blood in game one. Don't be fooled by the smiles. Tensions are mounting. Game two is on the way. On a bay day suited for an oil painting, two elder gentlemen enjoyed their first days ever in the postseason sun. Fittingly, it was an old-style game. Pitching and plenty of it. Jason Schmidt went the route with a shutout. Josh Beckett almost matched him stride for stride. Barry Bonds did the little thing, which had resulted in the Giants' insurance run in a 2-0 win. Today, will the game's best player have a chance to play big? Pudge and the Marlins know what they need to be themselves. If they slash and if they dash, they can wing their way home with a split. Game two, coming up next. Welcome back to Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. The orange towels and fingers are out because game one was a thumbs up, if you will, for the Giants. They won a 2 0, and we get set for game two of this NLDS between the San Francisco Giants and the Florida Marlins. You can sense October's in the air. Why? Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Berman. Glad you could be with us as we kick off our triple header coverage of the divisional round of the playoffs. October in the air because it's a little cooler temperature 64 degrees the sun might do a slow burn but it's got that fall feel and the Giants know that in this brief history of the division series in the National League at least 14 of the 16 teams that have won game one have gone on to win the series but Tony Gwynn the Florida Marlins say that's great we don't care you don't have to be Einstein to figure out what they're hoping happens for them very early today yeah no question this Marlin lineup is really the two guys at the top set the table Juan Pierre and Luis Castillo yesterday went 0 for 8 they don't feel like today's going to be the same type of game that they saw yesterday so hopefully today they can put the bat on the ball get on base make something happen for tomorrow it's only the third time all year that the two top guys Pierre and Castillo went 0 for 4 or worse so they don't expect to ha that to happen again uh, Rick Sutcliffe yesterday Josh Beckett pitched beautifully uh, and but it was the number five guy in the lineup little ball for Edgardo Alfonso little ball and then a big ball a double of the eight Barry Bonds walked three times will that change Florida's thinking will Bonds see maybe a bit more pitches to hit tonight Boomer I think there's a couple of reasons why this will be a different day for Barry Bonds one sure Alfonso not only did he produce yesterday but he's been one of the best hitters in the National League the whole second half of this season the other is the difference in starting pitchers Brad Penny on the mound today has the same type of stuff that Josh Beckett had yesterday but not the command when Penny gets ahead in the count most of the time Boomer he just tries to throw harder that doesn't work with Barry Bonds well Brad Penny is hoping to come up silver dollars today for the Florida Marlins and get them back in this thing for the Giants they send as you look at Penny they send the big fellas Sidney Ponson acquired to be their number two starter today they find out if they indeed have their man there's the view of McCovey Cove and Willie McCovey one of those that threw out the first pitch here today in San Francisco uh, joining us uh, throughout this series and uh, one of our ESPN baseball veteran announcers, Bob Carpenter. And Carpy, who's down on the field, I guess it won't take long for the Marlins to find out if this is indeed going to be a different day. Yeah, you're right about that, Chris. And the big reason Juan Pierre will be found out early is because he's been so good this year. He did something this year only five hitters in the last 80 years have done. 60 stolen bases and over 200 hits. Now, Maury Wills with the Dodgers, they were beaten by the Giants in the playoffs that year. And Juan Pierre joins Lou Brock as the only guys on that list who did not play for first place teams. And Chris, they say there were no first day jitters yesterday. It was Jason Schmidt the reason they went 0 for 8. Well, I think he would make Carpy anybody jittery in the performance that he had retiring the last 14 men. Here's today's starting lineup, sponsored by Bristol Myers Squibb and 
If uh, you were surprised to see the same lineup put out by Jack McKean, you should not be. There's the top here in Castillo. Fudge Rodriguez had one of the three hits yesterday. Derek Lee in the cleanup spot. Young 20-year-old Cabrera at third. And Carnacion and Prest in the field and at the plate and right. Jeff Conine, who's every Wednesday, he's automatic for Florida. Tony, uh, Alex Gonzalez, and then Brad Penny. And going up against them is the right-hander, just 3-6 and six this year with the Giants, but 17 wins overall with Baltimore and San Francisco, Sidney Ponson. Sutton. Well, I tell you what, they were up in the National League West by a dozen games before they acquired Ponson. But that's what good teams do. They go out and they try to improve when they have, have the opportunity to do that. We're going to find out if they improved or not with what happens here today. Ponson has been, uh, yeah, they, they say he's pitched a lot better than that three and six mark. But really, the reason why he and Kirk Reeder went down to, as Felipe Alou told us yesterday, the weather, and meaning whether or not they won game one or not, was he and Kirk Reeder is now that they haven't yet seen Jason Smith Jr. out of Ponson. Maybe today they start to see Jason Smith Jr. And here is the man that Carpy and Tony talked about, Juan Pierre. 200 hit season a couple of years ago with Colorado and 200 hits 204 to be exact this year. Fonzo pinching in a third right away. Tony we've already seen something different here today. Luis Castillo saying in the paper how they tried to work the count with Jason Schmidt but it was always strike one. Yeah. And that's you know, Pierre if you look at yesterday's first inning Pierre saw five pitches and struck out and then Castillo because of the overpowering fastball, that's what makes guys feel uncomfortable about working a camp. Well, here's a difference already. Pierre, base hit to start the afternoon. And Pierre, the major league stolen base leader with 65. Jack McKeon tells us not that today is different because they lost game one. He and the top of the lineup were about to have the green light, fellas. Yeah, I think both of them, uh, Castillo and Pierre, felt a little bit more comfortable because post Ponson doesn't have the overpowering fastball like a like a Schmidt, so they felt like um, today was going to be a little bit easier day to get the bat on the ball, and and if they could, they could make some things happen easier. Now, and Ponson, who so let me ask you this: you know that Florida's going to run; they have 150 stolen bases, the most in the major leagues. Ponson's a big guy, right-handed. Is he slow to? Is he easier for Florida to run off? He can speed it up when he has to. And this is a situation, obviously, where he needs to do that. Here is also a situation, and Tony, you mentioned it, how Jack McKeon loves to get that early lead. And it's not only the stolen base from Pierre that, that has provided some of those runs, but Castillo, one of the league leaders in sacrifice bunt. Just get him in the scoring position and then let Pudge and Derek Lee do what they do best. Yeah, Derek, uh, Jack McKeon loved this situation, especially with oh. that guy hitting. Well, Castillo almost uh, took the wickets off a of second base umpire, Larry Young. So today, a completely different start for the Florida Marlins with Pudge Rodriguez coming up. Defensively for the Giants, they have the same lineup as we saw yesterday. These are two of the best defensive teams in all of baseball, Tony. Yeah, no question about it. Both teams um, usually don't beat themselves, although we saw an error yesterday from Florida on the defensive end. Both of these teams are still two of the better defensive teams in the in, in both in the league two things I saw in that dugout already I didn't see yesterday you saw a lot of people clapping hands saying here we go after the base hit by Pierre and there are a lot of feet tapping <laughs> underneath those guys in that dugout we know what that means don't yeah, it? it looks like everybody on the team is up on that top rail and that's that's a, a good sign for the Marlins so now punch Rodriguez we saw Alfonso in the five hole punt yesterday Turned out to be one of the key plays in the game. And here's Pudge, the three-hitter, squaring a bunt. Surprise? Not really, because uh, talking to Jack McKeon today, he said his team plays a lot better when it has the lead. And so it uh, wouldn't surprise me at all to see uh, Pudge get the bunt down, get these guys in scoring position, or possibly both of these runners take off and, and steal a bunt. And there's the pitch that we uh, were talking to, actually, shot Jason Schmidt about. The punts on the heavy pitch that, that Pudge swung over that's what makes him such a good pitcher he's got the ability to throw one pitch in this situation and get two outs that infield defense knows that as well they're ready to go they're looking for that ground ball they get a fly ball instead to center Marquise Grissom 
one out. Now, since September 6th, the Marlins have gone 15 and 6. This is as telling as we could show you. The 15 games they've won, the top of the order, Pierre and Castillo hit 364, scoring 23 runs. In the six losses, they're on the interstate. So, again, no need to be Einstein or even Ben Franklin or anybody, any, any relative genius to figure out. And the Marlins like the way it started this far. No, no question. And uh, yesterday, neither one of those guys were able to get on base. And already here in the first, Pierre's in scoring position already. I think one interesting thing that Jack McKeon said about Castillo is that he likes hitting number two. He likes having the versatility of having a bunt, maybe hitting it, turning it into hit and run. He's been better at driving in the run. This is Derek Lee, the first baseman, the fine fielding first baseman, and pumps on in there with a strength. Lee, the first round draft pick of the San Diego Padres in 94, came over to Florida in a trade December 97 for Kevin Brown. Brown paid immediate dividends for the Padres in 98, the World Series Padres. I think Tony might remember it. They're hoping that Lee can pay big dividends now. Vaguely remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> he was pretty good, as I recall. He, he was okay. Yeah, he was great for us. This guy, Derek Lee, has turned into a great player for the Marlins, too. And that just goes with experience, doesn't it, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. Young players with talent do that. He's, he's paid his dues, and, and he's gotten a lot better. 0-2 pitch. Bounces away from Benito Santiago, and they don't even need that much for the speedy Pierre and Castillo to move up. So two runners in scoring position now for Florida here in the top of the first. Boy, what a difference a day makes. Right when they decide not to sacrifice bunt, Yvonne Rodriguez not able to advance the runners. Neither is Benito Santiago able to control that breaking ball in the dirt. That is a play that should have been made by the Giants catcher. So now Pierre and Castillo will eye the third base coach, Ozzie Guillen, for any ball hit. Ponson in, the ball on the fist. Aurelia got to go to first to snow in time, but Pierre scores, and the Marlins are on the board. I don't think that concerns Felipe Alou a whole lot. He feels like his team is going to have some fun offensively as well today. Otherwise, he would have brought that infield in with Ponson being ahead in the count on Derek Lee. I think both managers feel like both teams are going to be able to put runs on the board. I mean, yesterday, I think all of us got the sense that one run might be enough to win, and I don't think that's the case today. I think both teams feel like they're going to be able to make some things happen offensively. This is Miguel Cabrera, the 20-year-old third baseman. Well, just think about it yesterday. Okay? You get the number one starters for everybody going. 3-1 in New York, 2-0 here, 4-2 in Atlanta. It's not a, with the, the Cubs winning with Terry Wood. Not like a shot today. Number two starters going, except in the Boston game later on tonight. Doesn't mean they're not capable, but but number one is a number one, that's right? Exactly. That's exactly that's why right. they call you number one. Mm -hmm. That first game, that's why a lot of teams feel like they got to, you know, if you're the home team, you feel like you got to win that first game because you've got your best guy on the hill. But, and for the visiting teams, if you can steal one against the best guys, then, you know, you feel like you have the advantage. One one, the count to Cabrera. Lofts it to right. Jose Cruz Jr. is there. And the Giants get out of it relatively, but Florida's top of the order is hitting. It results in a run. Back in San Francisco with the Giants coming to bat. Back here in San Francisco, Chris Berman, Tony Gwynn, Rick Sutcliffe. Glad to be with us for game two of this Marlins Giants series. And our uh, starting lineup for the Giants, sponsored by Bristol Meyer Squibb. That's also the same as yesterday. Ray Durham led off the game with a uh, single. J.T. Snow, Rich Aurelia hit the ball hard, had nothing to show for it. Barry Bonds, the 0 for 1, one run, three base on ball game. Alfonso with two hits, Santiago, Grissom, Cruz, and the pitcher, Sidney Ponson. Going up against, big right-hander from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 14 and 10, Brad Penny. First postseason start for the 25-year-old right-hander, but Boomer, it could not be at a worse time. And I'm not talking about it being October 1st. I'm talking about it being a day game. One in six with an ERA of 6.80 during the day this year. Well, hello. Ray Durham began yesterday's game with a base hit for the Giants. One pitch, and the Giants are running. So, 
All right, we predicted yesterday 3-1. It was 2-0. What do you guys feel? What kind? I'm not asking who wins. What kind of score today here, guys? I kind of feel like it's going to be one of those games where both teams are able to get some things going offensively, whether it's a long ball or whether it's rallies. I'm kind of in a 5-3, 6-4 kind of type of game. I I'm right there with you, Tony, but i got to be honest. I could not tell you who's going to win. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not asking that. That's, that's why they play the game. That's right. right? 6 4 ish feel, huh? Well, thus far, it would seem to be that way. JT Snow. And a, uh, really his best, I think, offensive year in a few for the Giants, although his, if you remember, late August and September and postseason last year were outstanding. Snow this year at the 273. I know he's hit more homers than the eight that he had this year, but he feels better at the plate. Pudge setting up outside. In there for a strike and snow to like it. Bill Miller is the home plate umpire. Well, I looked at JT turn back to the umpire as if to say, wait a minute now. That, that you know, that looks like some of the strikes that were called yesterday. Bill Miller, unlike John Hirschbeck, yesterday's umpire, is more so of a hitter's type umpire. Usually real consistent, but not usually real big. Miller is the plate umpire. Brian Gorman at first. Larry Young is at second. Ed Rapuano from uh, North Haven, Connecticut is at third. Mark Wagner at left and John Hirschbeck at right. And we know who that guy is. He'll be up four. Snow could not hold that one. And he will sit. So strikeout for Brad Penny. And as Rich Aurelio comes up, this is the fine defensive club that he has behind him. Tony. Yeah, and it's the same lineup that was out there yesterday. This, this is a really good defense. And, and you know, I, I said yesterday, I'm continually impressed with that guy, Juan Encarnacion in right field. He made a bunch of plays in the first inning, but wasn't heard from, but he does a great job for this Marlins defense. He is part of the reason why the Marlins have had a re-Encarnacion this year. Ball squirts loose from Lee, but the Zerm won't go in. I tell you what, you got to start though with the improvement on this team right there. They are better in with their team batting average. They're better with their ERA overall. They're better with their fielding percentage. He has had a lot to do with every one of those things from a year ago. Penny to the plate. Really, it takes it for a ball. Well, and we said it yesterday too. If you build a football team, what are the things you got to do? Well, you, you better be able to run the ball, and you better be able to stop the run. Pudge Rodriguez certainly stops the run, and we know Florida has stolen more bases than anybody. So, And Durham can run, and, and, and Brad Penny's big with a big, slow leg kick. But you know what? Durham hadn't even thought about going yet because of Pudge. And that's an outstanding point because he got, the first, he got a base hit on the first pitch of the game, and he hadn't even attempted to even bluff steal in second base and it's because of that guy right there Pudge Rodriguez behind him. That's why I was a little bit surprised that, that Felipe didn't have JT bunt. I, 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 I was really looking for that. I know he's only had one sacrifice bunt all year but if you're not going to try to steal second base why not just hand that to him and then let your three and four guys do what they're supposed to do. One and one to Aurelia. Bottom of the first. Up and in. Two and one, you know, just to complete the punch. For most catchers, throwing out 20 of 60, 33 percent is a pretty good number. For him, it's not. The career is 49 percent of the runners he's thrown out, which is why he's won 10 straight Gold Gloves from '92 to 2001. But only 60 attempts all year. Well, they don't even start, right? They don't even get going. And we see the way he's blocked the plate yeah. yesterday on an epic pass. I'll tell you another thing, too, Tony. You know well that runner at first base. Even with that ball in the dirt there, he comes up with it like a shortstop. Look at Pudd. You're right. He looked down there. I mean, you you just get a little goofy down there. For, he'll pick you off. Yeah, he, he loves get when people challenge him. He loves to throw behind runners. He loves when people try to steal bases. And this is a 3 1 count. This is a running camp. And here he goes. Durham running, but he's going to have to retrace his steps. Maybe Encarnacion at the wall makes the catch. 
Durham back to first. And again, Aurelio with a long out. He's been on the ball and has nothing to show for it. He was terrific yesterday. Yep. He told me the, the last at bat that he had, the ball that he hit to center field, he, he got it. He said, I squared up on that ball. I centered it, but it didn't go anywhere. The wind here is so unpredictable. You just never know. The only guy that it doesn't affect standing at home plate right now. Well, now we get a runner at first with two outs, so Bond should see something. There's a ball, but he should see something. I agree. I I, I think Kenning's going to take his shot, but, you know, he's not, he does not want to make a mistake that Bonds could hit out of the ballpark. And so he's going to pitch him carefully. Rip past the diving lead down the line. With two outs, Durham will scoot. Encarnacion has a great arm, but the ball gets hung up there. There'll be no play. We're tied at one. Tony, you give the RBI to Barry Bonds, but you have to give some of the credit to the guy hitting behind him, Alfonso, for him getting that pitch. Yeah, and I think the other thing you touched on in the open is that he is not the type of guy that's going to be able to locate like Beckett did yesterday. This ball was supposed to be out over the plate. Instead, it was in on the inner half of the plate, and Barry Bonds hit a bullet right down the right field line and drove in the run. Well, I know you can't guard the line in the first inning. Lee is such a good player. Eh? I don't know. It, it looked like there was a little room. He, or no. Just, it was scalded. Goodbye. Oh, was smoked. As is this one. Alfonso to right center field. But it hangs up for Encarnacion. So, a different sort of game on. The bats are here. We're 1-1 one after one. Welcome back to San Francisco. Yesterday we had a total of six hits in the first inning. Today we've already had four hits and as many runs today as we had all day yesterday, courtesy of Jason Schmidt and Josh Beckett. So we begin the second, six, seven, eight for Florida. Juan Encarnacion, Jeff Conine, and Alex Gonzalez. Fly ball to right. Cruz going back with plenty of room. One out. Let's go down to Bob Carpenter. What are you doubling as a weatherman now, Carp? Hey, Chris, you don't have to have the AMS seal of approval down here <laughs> to know it's a different day than yesterday. It's about 10 degrees cooler. The clouds overhead are moving very fast. And guys, don't be fooled by the flags. They look like the wind's blowing out. But down here on the field, you can feel it coming in from the right field corner. Now, Juan Pierre just told me when he came into the dugout, he said, it's tricky out there. I feel the wind at my back, but the ball is really taken off in the outfield. All right, Carpy, thank you. I, I mean, Tony, you and Sud, you played, well, a candlestick, which is a different animal, but still San Francisco wins. I remember as we watched Jeff Conine, who has certainly been a, in no other way to say it, a Wednesday hero for these Florida Marlins. We've seen him on all the Wednesdays, Tony. He's certainly delivered. Just the weather. I remember talking to Dwayne Kuyper, who played second base here for the Giants for seven years and is one of their fine broadcasters. He and Brooke, you know, do a nice job. And I said, how long did it take you to get used to the winds? In the seven years, he goes, I, I, I never did. Yeah. That <laughs> does. No, true. Alfonso with third on a sharply hit ball by Conine over the snow in his two outs. Now, as an outfielder, you know, Bob, Bob Carpenter hit on it. Absolutely correct. You can't look at the flagpole. See Alfonso stand down on that ball. The ball stayed down on him, kind of handcuffed him. But well, the hawk would be not yet. The hawk is that wind that kicks up at about three o'clock, six point two miles from here. Yeah. And you know, not a small craft advisory yet. What did the hawk have to say to you the other day? Buddy? I went out. You you know that I visited Candlestick. I always do. It's convenient to the airport. You got to pass it. But I went out and about six o'clock. It was it was brisk. It was it was uh, made both of my hair stand straight up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was you know it was hard. Yeah, you know, getting the getting the <laughs> getting a little. Little dabble, do you? And, and, and one down, two Tony, down. Tony, you should see him too, man. I mean, he like. 
He breathes oh, deep, yeah. man. He has like moments of silence where I, I don't know. He's talking to somebody. I talk to Candlestick. It talks to me. That's the scary part. <laughs> you were out there looking at me that, like. That wind did pick up when you got out of the car. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it knew. The Chubb Feeney winds were blowing. I will buy this land in, in the morning when there's no wind. What do you mean it's windy here in the <laughs> afternoon? I didn't know that. It's so remarkable what they've done here, though. Remember how uncomfortable, Tony, it was in the dugouts with the gust and what have you? Yep. That ball is well struck by Alex Gonzalez, and Barnes is there to snare it. He did it with his feet yesterday by stealing a base. Today, he does it with the bat and the glove. Hello. Back in San Francisco, a little bit of early afternoon fog. That man's certainly not in a fog. Fine catch to end the Marlins second by Barry Bonds. And now 6-7-8 for the Giants. In this 1-1 game, Benito Santiago, Marquise Grissom, Jose Cruz. Benny, a one-time teammate of yours, Tony, a rookie of the year in 87. He, he's, he almost seems like he got to age 35 a few years ago and then made a left turn. And yeah. He's getting younger, he's, as if he's Ponce de Leon. He's a, kind of reminding you of the old Benny, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, I mean, and you know what? I, I honestly think he's a better player now these last three years than he was when he first came up. Yeah, yeah he had the hitting streak. Yeah, he was known for throwing guys out from his knees, but he calls a game much better, much better defensively now, too. That accident had a lot to do with it. I, 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 I think it did. He matured. He came back smarter. The game's more important to him now, and I'll tell you what, I know he's a free agent, and, and, and they love their young catcher, Tori Alba, but this guy's still got some good years left ahead of him. Absolutely. Well, let me tell you something after this pitch. One, two on the way. Outside, two and two. He has been among the biggest of when they got him. They, they didn't even know. They were just hoping it was a stopgap catching situation yep. at that time yep. in 2001. The three years he's given them are two and a half more than anybody. Ryan Sabia, Ned Coletti, uh, manager Dusty Baker at the time, and now Felipe. Anybody could have expected. Just when you think he's run out of the time, he, he keeps doing it. I mean, he's. You're right. Felipe Alou said yesterday that. Uh, uh, normally, this would be a situation where he would catch Tori Abba with, with Ponson going, but uh, Benito has been the guy to get big hits for his team that yeah. gave them victories, and he was going to go with Benito today. Another count. Well, he offered, huh? Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, he. That was such a big bender. Well, here's the. There's another bender that the left fielder, Mr. Bonds, made. How about that, though? Yeah, dead run, ball down, so he's got to get down there and get his glove down there to make the play. And really, he made it look relatively easy. Speaking of showing the old form, right? Yep. Well, he did it with that stolen base in the eighth inning yesterday. That was his first stolen base since his 500th stolen base against Eric Gagne. And Felipe Alou was saying he didn't have many of them, but each one of them that he has gotten has been important. Well, that one was in the ninth inning, and you've got the second, and Santiago base hit, and eighth inning. Well, yesterday was eighth, but the one that they, they beat Gagne with was nine, and he's picked his spots. But, you know, when you have 500 stolen bases, you... you and when you're 39, yeah, yeah, you do. You pick your spots. <laughs> you know, you want to, I mean, because in his case, like in a series like this, we saw it yesterday. If his team is up 4 nothing, he's not going to run in that situation. But with his team up one nothing, and a chance for possibly some insurance, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna try to run. Talking to him before the ball game today, he said, I said, how you doing? He said, son, I'm sore. He said, just ask Tony. Yeah. <laughs> he said, he, I said, what sore? He said, everything. Everything sore this time of year for even the young guys. I mean, you, you're you going to have to tell me how it feels to be an everyday player like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a grind during the regular season. You rejuvenate it because you're in the playoffs. But, you know, as you get older, 
it, it's it's tougher. It's tougher to come out here and, and, just, and play day games, and you get a little stiff and a little soreness. And he doesn't normally play day games. And I mean, exactly. only played about half of them during the and course of the year, which was the reason the Giants didn't play very well. Sore making it to the booth for two straight one o'clock starts, pal. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's a soreness from the neck up. Tony's talking about the neck down. I understand. <laughs> Now the big bender by Penny and two strikeouts. Santiago and Grissom are gone. You're going to see the same type of stuff with the exception of the changeup mm. that you saw yesterday with Josh Beckett. Yeah. The man with the fastball it, it is not quite the same. But, you know, even though Beckett's a couple of years younger than Penny, uh, Penny's proud of that heater. I mean, he even though Bond's got him there, I, he, he's going to come back and challenge again before this day is over with. Yeah. Yeah, they see number 22 at the plate. Another one of those uh, fellas that uh, threw out the first pitch along with Willie McCovey. There were several. There was another 22 that wore it pretty proudly here for San Francisco. Will Clark. You see 22 crews saw Clark in the dugout. And the thrill is back. Great gone. That's right. Great history when you come in here. I know the park's only been here four years, but you know, when you have Willie Mays and Willie McCovey and Orlando Cepeda, who I saw and talked yeah. to yesterday after the game, and you know, Vita Blue, who's, you know, he's around, and not to mention a guy like a Clark. I mean, it's, you know, I don't think we're going to get Christy Matheson or John McGraw, but, you, you know, they, the history of this franchise, of course, McCovey Cove, and there's that statue out there, and we are, after all, at 24 Willie Mays Plaza, yeah. okay? Let's not forget the address. You feel... One of the things McGowan has done, uh, and Bob Lurie did too, but it is, is, hey, the New York Giants have a proud history. They, even though it's been 45 years since they've been out to San Francisco, let's link it and let everybody know. And you have a lot of posters around the park, it, underneath uh, where you walk to get your hot dogs and all. Here's a picture of Mel Ott. Here's yeah. a picture of Bill Terry. I think it's good for young people to look at Absolutely. and say, who is that guy, Dad? Well, I don't know, but maybe we can look up uh, some about them. Well, they're all in the Hall of Fame. And, and I... I'm a big fan myself, and I was reading signs myself this morning walking. Were you? Through. Yeah. Oh, a three strikeout inning for Brad Penny. He has four. One, one for two. You must feel obliged to say bonds. Barry Bonds. As we begin the third inning of a 1-1 game. Ground out by Derek Lee. Drove in the uh, run for the Marlins in the first. Two out double by Barry Bonds. Drove in the giant run in the bottom of the first. 9-1-2. Penny Pierre Castillo. This guy can swing it a little bit. Got some power. Two big. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Two big fellas. Ponson 6-1-249. Penny 6'4, 250. So they add those two to the three of us, and we <laughs> have know. ourselves a new rushing record, I think, in the NFL, right? The largest booth and the largest the largest pitchers going, right? Yep. And man. <laughs> there it is, son. You called it Penny right on it. And the Marlins have their third hit of the afternoon. I think that's where pride gets in the way of, of with a pitcher a lot of times. I mean, all Ponson's got to do is throw some breaking balls. He's got great command of the slider, but he continues to challenge with that sinking fastball. And when I talk about a, a good hitting pitcher, that's all I'm saying, Tony. He can hit the fastball. Yeah. They don't hit anything else. Now, how about what Kerry Wood did last night to help his cause, huh? There, there's no question as a starting pitcher. You can help yourself. Especially in playoff baseball, if you could just put the bat on the mm -hmm. ball. Well, now two guys that did put the bat on the ball. They both singled to start the game. Juan Pierre and Luis Castillo. Now he tried to pull it back, but did not. Do you watch Pierre? I'm sure you did watch the batting practice. Yeah. He spends bunts to the left side, drop bunts in front of the plate, bunts to the right side. I mean, it's not half his hacks, but our... our the two of them, but especially Pierre. Right? Yeah, well, one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, this is not a guy who cannot swing the bat, and he has to bunt. He swung it hard to Aurelia. Penny not going very far. Boy, he hit it well, but there's one out. And that was one of the things I think he was trying to set up that A.B., was the fake bunt 
to get Alfonso to charge in and then mm -hmm. possibly bunt it by him. And instead, he hits a line drive. And that's just bad luck. Because and that is. There's not an infielder out there that could have taken more than one step in either direction on a ball hit like that. So here is Luis Castillo. Singled in the first inning. Now I want you to look. Now he won't probably. He'll be trying to swing now. I mean he's not going to be trying to drop anything at this point. Well if he does now it's going to be for a base hit. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be a sacrifice like Pierre was attempting. Alfonso in on the grass a third just in case and try to go other way and foul it back. I will tell you this. All right, take a look at the at the area in front of the plate. It's um. It's a little damp. Now I let me also tell you a little talk with folks this sort of clay late in the year they no matter who they put they always water it more it dries out bakes actually September and October are warmer months in the whole summer but I just am pointing out that it looks a little darker in front of the plate as opposed to deaden I mean to deaden a potential ball to more chop mm -hmm. does that look that way to you Tony? I totally agree and you know talking to Jack McKean about that this morning they said they're used to it it happens with them all the time now whether it's this is just normal procedure here or not. You know, it's out of, I, I don't know. I just know that, uh, you know, these guys were checking that out this morning during back, batting practice. They were checking it out yesterday, especially the top two guys in the lineup. You don't do anything like that at Sandy. Oh, no. Do you, do oh, no. Me? No. No. <laughs> well, no, everything measures out the way it should. Well, Jack did tell us that he didn't think that it was re any problem between first and second, although there was some talk that there's a little more water on the dirt between first and second than might normally be nice play by Santiago let me just complete that story history 1962 Candlestick Park Maury Wills Dodgers Giants best of three NL playoffs it was like running through a quagmire the one game that they had in San Francisco which the Giants <laughs> won, and then they won game three and won it you also remember that was the Dodgers Oh, yeah. oh, you know, they love each other. Guys. Oh, yeah. Gosh, especially 62. You got to start him now, don't you, Tony? Even though it's the pitch. You know what? And, and Jack McKeon talked about this this morning. This guy loves batting, too, because of versatility. And, of course, I put the kiss of death on him, and he strikes out. Good job by Ponson there coming in. Well, you know what? I, I think that the Florida Marlins are making it easier for him because it, you're not sending the runner. They didn't attempt a, a stolen base in the first inning when they had their two guys on bases. They're they're kind of letting the game come to them rather than like the Florida Marlins have done all year, Tony, taking it yep, to them. Making it happen. Forcing the issue. Forcing the defense to make plays. And granted, you got your pitcher out there and normally Castillo's the guy that puts the bat on the ball. This is Pudge Rodriguez. One hit yesterday. Flew out to center to make the first out in the first inning today and Ponson drops in a strike. You know most people foul back. most people I think in the offseason when Fudge Rodriguez signed with the Marlins said what are you doing yeah. right. Is that the only place you can get an offer. What are you going there for. He included. I right? thought the exact same thing. And Knew that Florida had a had some young pitchers who they really like and and as the season started started it, it made sense. It was a perfect spot. But they needed somebody to to really kind of take control. Little chopper and that'll go foul. Well what they were doing was building as it's turned out a contender way below the radar when they signed him. And then they get her being in early July before the All Star break. And I really they didn't trade Lowell. And I love what they've done here. I mean, it you know been six years since they've been in the postseason, but that '97 team was, was basically bought. Yes. I mean, this team has been developed, and and because of, of the talent and and the youth, Tony, they got a chance to get better. And the other thing, I mean, you know, that that '97 team, a lot of these guys came over off of those the trades that they made. Hit well to right, but Cruz is there. So the leadoff single, Penny is uh, stranded. We head now to the bottom of the third at a 1-1 tie. Chris Berman, Tony Gwynn, Rick Sutcliffe with you here at Pac Bell Park for a 1-1 game. Game two of the NLDS between the Marlins and Giants. 
bottom of the third. As we kick off our triple header, man, it's a great day to be a baseball fan, and we're happy to bring you all three games on ESPN. Cubs and Braves, game two, with uh, John and Joe going to Atlanta tonight. Zambrano and Hampton, that's at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. And then we can drive across the bay and go watch Pedro Martinez and Tim Hudson pitch as Boston plays Oakland at 10 Eastern, 7 on the West Coast, and that would be 4 o'clock in Hawaii. Dave O'Brien, Dave Justice, Jeff Brantley on the call. We don't get many opportunities to go watch a baseball game as a fan, but you going? I'm not going to miss this one. Sidney Ponson trying to do what Brad Penny did leading off the third, but he flies out to center field. Juan Pierre. Well, let's see. You got we go along here, finish about four ish. We finish up what we have to do, 435. To be in the teeth of rush hour, Sut, going across the Bay Bridge, but seven o'clock start. What do you think? You get the police escort? You in? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm on your coattail again. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't make that connection yet. Uh, you need, they're easily done. And I think that's the, whoever wins that ball game, to me, Tony wins that series. That's a hell of a series. Ray Durham looks at strike one. This guy's had that same type of year here. I mean, they're 37 games over 500 in the ball games that Durham has started this year. They're a 500 team without him. You see right away after Durham got the base hit on the fastball, the first pitch fastball, the first at bat, he's mixing it up on him. And he looks to have pretty good command of that breaking ball today. Then he's showing a little bit of maturity too. He knew he'd take a strike after retiring the pitcher. Durham trying to give him some time. He threw a fastball away, and now it comes back with two breaking balls, two easy outs. So two fly ball outs to uh, the center fielder Pierre. JT Snow coming up, and a yeah, proud moment we uh, visited with the parents yesterday of Josh Beck, and there's Donna and Dwayne Penny from. Yeah, I know that uh, Brad lives at Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and uh, Oklahomans very proud as they should be of their son who. Has just completed his fourth year in the bigs, and uh, I know that Marlin history. It's only 10 years old, but a couple more wins, and of the most wins in franchise history. I know that you know it's not Cyan or Walter Johnson or Christy Matthewson, but so what? Yeah, I mean, He's you're number book. one. You're number yeah, one, right? You're number one in the in, in the team book. You're number one in the team book. Just a couple more. Dempster, I think, has the most. J.T. Snow fouls that away. Well, you're, you're looking at Penny out there, and you saw his folks. Uh, acquired by this team from Arizona in July of 1999 for Matt Manti. And uh, he's Arizona, a young team, in Florida, another young team. Had some right shoulder problems one year in 2000. He made a pitch for the Pan Am team in 1999. And, you, know, you talk about the Marlins, the future is, is, uh, is only going to get brighter. Well, Look at this stamp. Yeah. The first time I saw Brad Penny was in the California League. He pitched for High Desert, an outstanding prospect there. And in the last four years, Boomer, these Florida Marlins have had five players play in that Futures game, which is the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Broken bat. Yeah, it'll be foul. I do you enjoy going to that. We're always around that on the Sunday, the Futures game. And it's, it's kind of fun to see those guys. Yeah. The big League party. They get excited, right? It is. It's uh. It, it's nice for us to do those games too because it gives the fans an opportunity to see these guys who are going to be in the big leagues and a lot of them play in that game right. in July and are in the big leagues in September and Josh Beckett was one of them. Yep. Cabrera's played in a yep. couple of them. They not only play but the, the, they play for a long yeah, time. Yeah and, and excel. One two pitch to snow. Alfonso, a former MVP in Boston of that game. Sean Burroughs, the fine third baseman with the Padres, an MVP of that game. It used to be, the takeoff grounds used to be the Alaska League, right, and the Cape yeah, League, right? Yeah, right. I mean, not for everyone, but... And that's still the same. Yeah. It's, just... it's another outlet. Castillo with second, throw over to Lee, and a 1-2-3 inning for Brad Penny against the Giants. So the pitcher's settling in. We're settling into a 1-1 one -one game. Mm. <laughs> Set. is that the best seat you can get? <laughs> <laughs> you think they're fishing for Marlins? Yes, here they are. Man, they're ready just in case. I'm going to sit in a glove, and I'm going to do it out in McCovey Cove. The kayaks and the canoes and the gloves and the boats. And I mean, you, it's one way to watch the game. 
As we begin the fourth inning, that's Derek Lee. An infield pop up, Rick Carilia there. And there is one out. And Miguel Cabrera now coming up. And the MetLife blimp, Snoopy, too. Checking out, there's Alcatraz. Sud escape from there recently. He's cruising the skies of San Francisco to provide aerial coverage of game one of the NL. Uh, Game two. See, we have to update these things. The blimp typically cruises at a speed of 35 miles an hour and an altitude of 1,200 feet. The MetLife blimp in a town near you. Thanks, fellas, for giving us some interesting views of the most picturesque city in this country and maybe you could argue the world. And, Tony, I thought you made an in interesting observation between innings about the starting pitchers and where they start out with their foot on the mound. You can see Ponzone is on the third base side of the mound. And just like he did with Derek Lee, like he did with Encarnacion, he's pounding the ball into them. He's staying on that side of the plate, staying on line with that. Yeah. He missed bad with his location here to Cabrera on the first pitch because he tried to go to the first base side of home plate. And if, if you're a right-handed hitter, you've got to be cognizant of the ball inside. You have to be. Because he's all the way over on the third base side of rubber. Just like on the flip side, the Giants' left-handed hitters have to be cognizant of the ball inside because Penny's all the way on the first base side of the rubber. And so, you know, what this does is it allows a guy like Ponson, who's a, basically a sinker baller, yep. he can get away with throwing a, a, a really like a mediocre fastball out over the plate because guys are cognizant of the ball in. One, two pitch to Cabrera is inside. How about the compliment paid to Cabrera? before the game by Felipe Alou. Two days in a row. Yeah. He said he, he he gave us the toughest at bats. He said we still don't know how to pitch him consistently. I don't know if there is a way yeah. to get this kid out. Well, he was very impressed with his composure with his ability to hit the ball the other way. You know, 20 years old and you know, he's standing up there swinging the bat like he'd been here for 10 years. Where's his age on his back? 20. 20 years old. I mean this is Andrew Jones. You give right, him something good, on the inside point. part of the plate, he's going to hit it out of here. Thus far, they, they've not made that mistake. It's 3-2 now. You don't want to walk him. I mean, I think this is where th this is the inning right now where both teams offensively need to get something done. You've got the heart of the order coming up for the Giants. You've got some power here in this inning for the Marlins. There's that pick busting down, and uh, Cabrera's gone. Two outs here in the fourth. Tonine was talking about that before the game. Now, this guy used to just be a power pitcher. In fastball situations, Tony, you got a fastball. He, he's not that way anymore. He has matured. He's developed. He's complete. Yeah, and you know, his ability now to not just try to overpower people, but pitch, you know? A ground ball sometimes is just as good as a strikeout. And if I can make a good pitch on the first pitch, I'm going to make it. In there for a strike to Juan Encarnacion. Conine in the on-deck circle, and the reason we bring that up is if anybody will have a clue on Ponson, it would be Conine, as they were Baltimore teammates for the majority of this season. And really, it's short. Fastball in. Snow at first. And a 1-2-3 inning for Sidney Ponson. Barry Bonds coming up with the Giants. The bottom of the fourth, and we come back. Back at the bottom of the fourth in a 1-1 game here at Pac Bell Park and ripping at the first pitch, but foul is Rich Aurelia. And here's Barry Bonds, who's double with two outs in the first inning, drove in the only run today for the Giants. He's on deck. Aurelia, as we talked before, flew out deep to right field. Hit the ball well in game one. Didn't get anything for it. Tries to push it past the pitcher, and he does! Oh, a little small ball for the Giants again. Hey, Sut, he's ripping it uh, 350 feet. He's getting nothing. Why not try a 50-footer? I, I think that's exactly what happened. I mean, he has hit the ball hard, Tony, this whole series. Yep. He had nothing to show for it until then. And it was a perfect bunt. Once he got it by the pitcher, it was just going to be a foot race between him and Brad Penny to first base. And again... Now, hold on. Now, Derek Lee calls time just for a moment. Now, again, they kind of sort of have to kind of pitch the bonds, don't they? Well, and they're not even going to hold Aurelia on. That's what the timeout was about. Derek Lee saying, I'm playing behind him. 
Well, he had a ball go right past his ankles on the uh, in the first inning. They're basically saying, go ahead, Richard Really, If you want to try to steal second, go ahead. We're not going to. Then we'll put Barry on. Richard put Barry on. That was, that was Bonds doubling down the right field line to knock in the run. And a diving catch for the third out. Now look, Felipe Alou said it best. You know, the, the fish is biting different every day. Every game is completely different. So not to say what he says with McKeon, but the situations have been different. They kind of have to sort of pitch to him, right? I mean, I know they're not here, but they walked intentionally yesterday twice. Yeah, it's... You know, I, I most teams feel like they'll take their chances. Well, anybody that's been walked intentionally with the bases loaded is Buck Showalter. Did for the Jack McKeon said, okay, I saw enough of this swinging thing, right? But now there's two on with none out, and here's Alfonso. This, this Tony is just like the postseason last year. He's had six at bats, and he's been on base five times. Yep. And he's probably had five pitches to hit in in both games so far. And two of them he smoked. Two of them hit right. Up. One of them was caught. Yeah, one of them was caught. Now what do you do if you're Felipe? I think he's going to give Alfonso one strike to maybe do something with a swing. Then he might go back to the bunt. Looks at ball one from Brad Penny. It's one, of, one of the things that makes me would make me nervous as a manager is you've got a man on first and nobody out. Bonds comes up to the plate and you tell him to pitch carefully. And so he throws four balls, you know, maybe a couple of them up, a couple of them down. And now he's got to refocus on that next guy after you walk on. Sometimes it takes a little bit of to get back in rhythm. He was in a really good rhythm early in this game. And that's that patience you talked about in the open yesterday. When they say be careful to him, what they're saying is throw something that looks like a strike that has movement out of the zone. Maybe he will expand that zone. Barry has quit doing that oh, yeah. the last two years. Yeah, he's done that, and he is not going to chase. And I think yesterday's hit by Alfonso in the eighth inning will make, will make him more relaxed about being patient up there because he trusts the guys behind him. Yeah, the visit from pitching coach Wayne Rosenthal. They talk about it, but it's another ball low, 2 and 0. So now, Alfonso looking for something he can sit on, perhaps. Well, they're taking a long look at third base coach Gene Glenn. He mentioned the hit and run to us yesterday being a possibility, something he might pull out in this series. It's hit pretty well to right center. Pierre's got a long run. He's not going to get it. Bonds is right out of really his tail. Castillo will throw to the plate. Safe and safe. 3-1 San Francisco. Again, fellas, Eduardo Alfonso standing tall in the five hole. Felipe Alou's been that guy. He's driven in a lot of runs throughout his career. He knows that Alfonso's smart enough to work the count to get a good pitch to hit. Aurelia had to tag if that ball was caught with nobody out getting the third base. And Tony Gwynn, we talk about the talent of Barry Bonds, but right along with that, nobody has better instincts than nobody. in him. I mean, and you saw that. He was. A little number by Benito Santiago by Butter gets the runner over to third base, Alfonso. And so the Giants with another run. Look at this. This is like drafting in an auto race, isn't it? And, and Barry Bonds knew he had a better look at that. He knew that ball was going to fall in. And Pierre picked this ball up on one bounce and started to get it back in. And Barry Bonds was already on Aurelius' tail to score the third run this inning. You know what that made me think of? Last year when J.T. Snow came around and scored and then had yeah. to pick Darren Baker up. <laughs> right. Well, there was no uh, youngster at the plate, but uh, there's always an adventure up. Uh-oh, Pudge fouled back off the paraphernalia and I caught Pudge in a bad spot. How many times has this happened this year to Pudge? probably two dozen and yet through it all 
I mean, he still performed offensively. He still performed defensively. And, Tony, he was able to play in 144 games this year at a position that demands a lot. Yeah, most catchers, most starting catchers are going to play anywhere 120, 130 right. games a year. And I think he realized that this young pitching staff needed him. And so he was out there a whole lot more than normal for starting catchers. Pudge back in there behind the plate. Marquise Grissom. Looks at a breaking ball. The infield in, but no. The run is going to score. It was against the body. Was third baseman Cabrera thought about trying it? Did not. And it's four to one Giants as Alfonso has played it. Felipe Alou managing only when he has to. You've got three, four, and five. You let him swing the bat. You get to the bottom of the order where we're at now. You got to do some things. Tony, he put on the contact play. That means anytime the ball is hit on the ground, regardless of where it's at, go. It got him a run. Yeah, and Alfonso got a great jump on that ball. And because Cabrera had to go to his left, a little bit of contact between him and Gonzalez this short. There was no way he could get him out at the plate. Once again, score another run. I love that. I mean, that, that's that's taking the game to him, yep. and that's not what the Marlins have done thus far in the ball game today. If that ball was hit right to Cabrera, he's thrown out by 30 feet, and as a manager, sometimes you look silly. Sometimes you look real good. I mean, you watch the jump by Alfonso. He's contact play. And because Cabrera has to go to his left, he's a little bit off balance as far as making him throw through the plate. So he has to go to first. Cruz swings at a breaking ball and strikes out, but not until the Giants hang an impressive three spot to lead four to one. Carl Ravitch, so much talk about intentional walks. You forget that Barry's not the only guy that can be intentionally walked. Well, you become consumed in the middle of that order. No doubt, I think that's happening with Jack there. You have Marquise Grissom, three to one game, man on third, one out. You got a guy coming up in the eighth hole who strikes out over 100 times a year and a pitcher behind him. Why not walk Grissom and play for the strikeout or double play in that situation? Didn't get that. Instead, they got a run. Let's go back to Chris. All right, Ravi, Bobby, thank you very much. Good to see you fellas. As we begin the bottom of the... Uh, we get the three-run bottom of the fourth for the Giants, and now Sidney Ponson is a three-run cushion to work with. As he starts at the bottom of the lineup for Florida, Conine, Gonzalez, Penny, but here we go with a three-run lead. He starts out with two balls. Sidney Ponson was acquired just before the trade deadline, and actually, like, minutes before the trading deadline, literally, on the 31st of July from the Orioles. For Damian Moss and Kurt Ainsworth, two guys that began the year in the Giants starting rotation. Chopper and Durham will not be able to get it. And Conine on a Wednesday is on base. <laughs> Just want to, what happened was Reeder came up lame that day. And remember, there were a lot of teams in the Ponson sweepstakes. And they really, the Giants didn't know, okay, we might not even have Reeder for a while. And he did go on the DL for the first time in his career. And they made the deal in a hurry. So here you go. You got a... a, a a promising left-handed minor league pitcher and then Moss and Ainsworth, two guys that were in their original starting rotation this year. So they get Ponson and they expect him. Peter McGowan, the owner, Brian Sabian, the general manager, Ned Coletti, assistant GM, expect him to be Schmidt Jr. Now, I'll just complete it in a minute as Alex Gonzalez is up. You know, his three and six record is a little puzzling to start. They made a move two years ago for Jason Schmidt. You know, Ponson is unsigned next year, but Schmidt liked the surroundings. You got a good defense. You got a good pitcher's park. You got a good team. Hey, maybe we will do a deal. They're hoping that this same sort of experience, A, Ponson becomes a big innings guy, and B, maybe they can sign him after this year. But for right now, they figure they got a horse and a, and a kind of a, a junior horse. That's the plan. He hadn't pitched quite that well thus far for the Giants. Not yet. And I think they're waiting, and they want to see in the postseason right now. I mean, this is an inning, for instance, you put three runs on the board. Foul by Gonzalez. You put three runs on the board, you want to be able to go out there and shut your opponent down to kind of take away any kind of momentum, um, keep momentum that you've already built in that, that, up that half bottom of the, of the uh, fourth inning where you put runs on the board. 
and Felipe Alou has said, you know, he has, he's pitched better than his record. He's three and six and hadn't had a whole lot of offensive support, but um, they good inning all the time though, right? He's Tony? kept him in every game and and he's, he does, he eats a lot of innings, he throws strikes and they're hoping that down the road, this guy could become their number one, become a number one type. Pitching is number two behind Schmidt. Bust that out on Gonzalez. So he will sit down, and that's going to be the end of the day for Brad Penny. So Jack McKean is going to his bench awfully early here, guys. We'll talk about it in a moment. Well, the assistant pitching coach right there picked up that strikeout. Benito Santiago, as most catchers are, walked out to the mound and said, what are you doing? You just hung an 0-2 breaking ball. You had him down in the count. Why did you let him back in? Start it on the outer half, get it off the plate, and get rid of him. Ponson did it. You saw Todd Hollinsworth pinch it yesterday in the eighth. Down 4-1 in the fifth. Jack McKeon figures let's start scrapping for runs. You got one run here in a game and a half thus far. Hollinsworth, as we told you yesterday, the rookie of the year in 96 back with the Dodgers. Uh, is married to the sister of giant relief pitcher Matt Burgess. We haven't seen that confrontation yet, but we might. Something to look forward to. And here's Ponson 2 and 0, although he came back on, uh, he came back before in this inning. Well, that's the way the Marlins set this this team up. I mean, they've got two more extra men than the Giants do, and the reason they've got one of the youngest staffs ever to go into a postseason. You had to figure they were going to struggle a little bit. You were going to have to get some pinch hits. There's a pretty good at bat by Hollandsworth again. Right through the hole on the left side. And now the Marlins have two runners on here in the fifth. Here's McKeon saying, hey, Brad, you pitched all right, but we got to get some runs. Oh, well, you got That's 14 tough. outs left. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, and a game and a half left, potentially. Yeah, potentially. And you cannot let these guys get in front of you. And without, you know, putting together, trying to put together some, some opportunities to put runs on the board. And, Tony, I thought you made a great point but, but between innings there about, I mean, they just kind of cut the heart out of that guy yeah. when they told him to be careful with Bond. I totally agree with that, Rick, because, you know, Brad Penny has the type of mentality. He wants to go after hitters. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be careful. He doesn't want to, you know, be a baby out there and, 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 and nibble trying to get somebody to fish. He wants to go right at people. And I think when when they, when Pudge went out there to talk to him, you know Bonds is coming up. Yeah, you know he's capable of hitting the ball out of the ballpark. But if you got a man on first. He his his I think his nature is he doesn't want to pitch around. He wants to go at him. And instead he walks him. And then he falls behind Alfonso. He doubles. Well, here come the Marlins. Pierre with a shot to right. Cruz is going to come up throwing, but he's going to come throwing a third. It's cut off. Wow. And Conine scores. Pierre has gotten him to four to two. That's not the first run that Juan Pierre has driven in this year. 41 RBIs is a lot for a guy in the leadoff spot when you're in the National League. You're going to get a lot of opportunities where the pitcher will sacrifice a guy in the scoring position, and you're only going to do that when your leadoff guy can produce a run. Pierre puts another one up. And I thought that was just great base running all the way around. Conine scoring, Hollinsworth going first to third. You know, really a cut that ball off, but he had a chance possibly of getting Hollinsworth at third. Here's that aggressiveness that this team Absolutely. has had all year. And the guy that started that was their third base coach. If he doesn't wave Conine in, that being Ozzie Gian, nobody can do what they've done now. Well, you see the Marlins, even the guys that on the paper are not on paper are not their speedsters. Here's Ozzie Sutt. Look at him. He's aggressive waving Conine in and then telling Hollinsworth to get to third. He knows it could be close. He tells him to get down. And they're running on a guy that was mm -hmm. second in this league in outfield assist. They say that Cruz should have a gold glove for the way he's played out there. Yet the Marlins get aggressive again like they've been all year. And so now with a run in, two men on, the dangerous Luis Castillo, one for two is up. Saw pitcher coach Dave Rigetti huddle at the mound. There's that little chopper. Aurelia could not turn the two, has to go to Snow, and the Marlins small ball plates another run. Hollinsworth scores. It's a one-run game. And they might not be done yet. They got another guy in scoring position because of the speed of Juan Pierre. I think the MVP to me right now, though, Tony, has got to be Ozzie Guillen. Yeah. 
I mean, he's not afraid. He wasn't afraid when he played. He wasn't afraid there. If he conserves himself and puts up the brakes, everybody would understand. Well, that's, you know, you got a great arm in the outfield. You had to do that. No, he didn't have to do that. He pressed the issue. He got that guy to third with one out. They got another run. And I think that's how they got to this point, being aggressive. And now Pudge Rodriguez up. Ball blocked nicely by Santiago. Action in both bullpens. You saw a moment ago Rick Helling, who will come in and be the new pitcher for the Marlins. They just stoked that fire, Tony. Pierre's out there wanting to steal third base now. They're yep. ready to go again. There is Hollinsworth's brother-in-law, Matt Hurgis. We mentioned the name, and he's up. He's up in the bullpen. Pierre, I mean, you look at him out there. He just looks fast standing off second, doesn't he? Yeah. Take third. They're, they don't even care. He's, he, if he gets an opportunity, he's going to try to steal third. Here he goes. Uncontested. Great job on the part of Pudge. And you know who was at fault there was Ponson. With two outs, your middle infielders have to protect against a ground ball getting through. The starting pitcher, the guy on the mound, is supposed to make him stop. He never did that. That base was given away by Ponson. And of course, it's easier to score in third base than it is in second. So, Even with two outs, a lot of people wouldn't try that. If they had two out of base hit, I'm going to score anyway. But what? Boomer, we've already seen that wild pitch result mm -hmm. in a run, and it was scored by the man trying to score another one down there. And look at the numbers already. Three for six, a run, two RBIs, a stolen base. They set the table. Plus Pierre dancing around, and Rodriguez has singled to right. Ponsold, they want him to stand up as number 1A starter, given a three-run lead. Promptly gives it up. Great rally by the Marlins. That's, a, that's excellent all the way around. Man. I think it's good managing by Jack McKeon going ahead and saying, hey, we need to put runs on the board to stay in this game. So he pinch hits for Penny. Hollinsworth mm -hmm. delivers. They play aggressive. Pierre goes, uh, gets the base hit. They go first to third. Pierre steals third because they're giving it to him. He scores on a base hit. And now we're even. Derek Lee up, and he flares one to right field. Cruz is there, but the Marlins have answered back. Heading to the bottom of the fifth here in San Francisco. Florida four, San Francisco four. Well, I don't think it's that cold out here, but, you know, it's California, bundle up. It just might as well bring the blanket to the park. Temperature low, 60. Sun really hasn't burned through, but the Marlins have broken through to tie this thing at four. And just as... Jack McKeon pinch hit for his pitcher, Brad Penny. Todd Hollinsworth was part of their three-run rally. Ponson coughs it up. Felipe Alou says, you know what, Sidney? That'll be it. Pedro Feliz Navidad is the pinch hitter against the new pitcher, Rick Helling. Hit a long way to right center. Pierre going back a long way. He hits back and hits off the wall. Bounds away from everybody. Feliz is heading for third. And so the Giants begin the bottom of the fifth with their pinch hitter with a triple. Well, when that ball left the bat, I didn't think it was going to go that far, but one year just kept on running, and he ran out of room. It's a long way, a deepest part of the park, Tony. And he, that ball hit the bottom of the wall, ricochets over both outfielders. Tony, let me ask you this, though. Why was Encarnacion so close to the play? Well, I think, I, I, I think like you, like we talked about early in the game, we didn't think, the, I didn't think that ball was going to go. And they're, they're running. He probably didn't realize how close to the wall he was standing. Pierre had, knew he couldn't, couldn't catch it. Oh, the throw by Pudge. Just in case Feliz was napping, he was not. But Pierre, Pierre knew he couldn't catch it, so he was trying to play the ricochet, and it bounced over both of those guys' heads. You see, Pudge, he loves to throw. He's not afraid, is he? He's not afraid. Rick Helling acquired from Baltimore in August. He's been a one-time 20-game winner with the Texas Rangers. I'm really surprised the infield. Old catcher. I'm sorry, it's tough. I'm just surprised the infield's in right yeah, now. So am I. You know, I think maybe Jack 
realizes the significance of him getting back into the game as quickly as he did. And, and once again, I said before, he, Jack feels like his club plays better with the lead than trying to play come from behind. And Rodriguez and Helen will talk it. I didn't mean to jump in there. Said the, uh, Rodriguez was his catcher when he was a 20-game winner with Texas a few years ago. And trying to settle down a guy that he's known quite well. Young man from North Dakota. He and Darren Erstad carry that flag proudly in the majors. That's a guy you got to pitch to. So what if Durham drives in that run? Let yep. him hit the yep. sacrifice yep. fly. You get Durham out, you get JT, you get a rear. You don't have to deal with Barry Bonds this inning. Well, now, without a ground ball double play, you do. Now, a very interesting folks in the Florida pen. We'll elaborate that on, on that in a moment. Durham aboard at first. Belize, the pinch hitter, is a third. And here's JT Snow. No fists it and giving it a good effort. Oh, down the stairs into the giant dugout goes Cabrera. The folks you saw on the pen is the game four starter and the all star, the sensation. The left hander is done. Well, here he goes down there. Look at this. That could have been potential big time trouble. That's so Willis. He's an athlete. Yep. He is. <laughs> he just. He kind of did a long jump all the way, all those stairs, and, and, and he's back. Oh, he's trying to catch Durham now. Dontro Willis will start game four. They have no real lefty in the pen that they really feel confident with. It's only Tahara, so he could be used on a throw day for one or two batters. Only the right-hander is Carl Pavano, who's the fifth starter and won't go in the series. But if they have to pitch the Bonds, it's going to be Willis. That's why it was so important that Kelly go after Ray Durham yeah. because, I mean, a ground ball, okay, you know, sacrifice fly, you give up a run, you're only down one. It's not like this offense can't manufacture one run. But by walking Durham, now, I mean, you've opened the door for possibly having another big in. JT's had his own conversations with the home plate umpires in both games, hasn't he? Yes, and, and I think one of the things that is tying him up is these pitchers pitching from the first base side of the rubber. You, as a hitter, you're cognizant of that ball inside. And it's hard to make the distinction what's a ball and what's a strike. And as you can see, Pudge is right under his knuckles. Pitch is right under his knuckles. And that's, inside. and that's, as a left-handed hitter, that's the decision you got to make when you're facing a pitcher who's pitching from the first base side of the rubber, like Ellen is, like Penny did. And the ball away, you can't give up on, and the ball in, you better be really sure when you take one. Because if it runs back over the inside, runs back towards the middle of the plate, they're going to get you. Runners at the corners in a tie game. Two balls, two strikes, none out to J.T. Snow. Helen's pitch. Out at the plate. We do it again. Well, would you guys have 6-4 type of game to begin? Yeah. We're on that pace, maybe more, huh? We like, might have underestimated. Yeah, I was just say. <laughs> Looks like both teams are, are, are going to put more than in on because they've made it look pretty easy putting runs in the board. Snow, a little looper to right, and the Giants have regained the lead. Belize scores. Durham to third. Tony, you called it. They're asking for a lot of trouble by not even throwing one strike to Ray Durham. Yeah, this is just a good, aggressive swing by Snow. Ball down and in. Ray Durham didn't hesitate, didn't even look. Just went first to third. And they still got nobody out here. Really into the plate, Bonds on deck. One run home. Foul back by the Giants shortstop. If you tune in late, 
Florida scored a run in the top of the first. The Giants answered that on a Bonds double, made it 1 1. And both pitchers settled in, Penny and Ponson, for a few innings. The Giants scored three in the bottom of the fourth to lead it 4 1. But then the Marlins erupted for three against Ponson in the top of the fifth to make it 4 4. San Francisco has just regained the lead 5 4 here in the bottom of the fifth. And both starting pitchers pinch hit for and gone. Some folks just getting home from work. Wonder if you feel like you missed nothing. Settle in and enjoy the rest of this. It's going to be a big finish. Foul ground for Derek Lee. He makes the play, and there's one out, and here comes Barry Bond. Let's see what happens here because I, I really felt like Brad Penny really started to struggle in his last at, bon, at bat to Bonds after he walked it. Right, but runners at first and third. McKeon wants no part of the man that's two home runs shy of Willie Mays. 658 lifetime home runs. McKeon saw the scorching double in the first inning inside the first base bag. So it doesn't matter what the signs are. Pitch to Barry. McKean says he's damned if you do and damned if you don't. He's going to be damned if you don't. Yep. He'll take his chances against Alfonso and Santiago. Well, Alfonso has been double in the first game, double in this game, RBIs. The rubber chickens are out. <laughs> And now McKeon to the mound. He is summoned. Helling is gone. The right-hander from Southington, Connecticut, Carl Pavano, will be coming in. Robbie, Bobby, thank you. Well, surely Bobby knows uh, Giorgio Alfonso, for sure. Managing him with the Mets for those... Uh, and this is the round in the division series that Alfonso excelled in in 1990 against Arizona. And looking at that studio, and I'm looking at the starting pitcher, his hometown is uh, one mile from where the studio sits. Southington, Connecticut, our neighbors to Bristol. I, I just, I have to laugh, Tony, because normally when there are men in first and third, that means you have to pitch to the guy, right? And if they had to pitch to Barry Bonds, they would have brought in Willis, right? Well, I guess the only way now, and, and you know, with Buck Showalter a few years ago, it wasn't even true then, but the only way you have to pitch to Bonds now is if the bases were loaded. They weren't loaded. They put him on. They bring in the right-hander, put his back to the wall with them loaded and only one out. Yeah. Loaded for Alfonso, who doubled in the fourth, a two-run double. Pavano, normally the fifth starter on this squad. Obviously, in the division series, he's going to the pen, and he starts off with a ball for Jack McKeon. One relief appearance this year for Pavano, and that was in the longest game in Florida Marlin history. That 20-inning ball game against the Cardinals, he came in. He gets the breaking ball for the strike. He's come into a situation where it's imperative that he comes out and throws strikes. I think he's in trouble, Tony. I see him moving that shoulder around. I mean, a starting pitcher like Helling has been most of his career. It's just difficult to go out there in this situation with your best stuff. Low and away, two and one. Well, he'd love to get a ground ball right here, that's for sure. Two one pitch. Sky to the infield, and that'll be the infield fly rule anyway, but snared by Gonzalez, and now two out for Benito Santiago. So so far so good for Carl Pavano. And that was a huge out right there. 
That was a real good pitch to hit. And he, he got it elevated and he kind of got away with it. I mean, this is the kind of ball if you're hitting, if you're hitting with the bases loaded, that's kind of where you want it right there. It's got sack fly written all it, over it, doesn't it? I mean, just lots of positives. He just changed pitch. his approach to me a lot. For some reason, all of a sudden, he wanted to pull the baseball yep. as opposed to hitting it to the opposite field yep. as he has in this series with success. Well, you fellas talked about it earlier. Felipe Luz saying one of the reasons I think Santiago has had some big at-bats for me. This at-bat changes this game. If not, we go to the post all the way. Good question. Uh, you had the bases loaded and one out. You had first and third and a run in with nobody out. And you come away with one run, boy, you're really going to be disappointed. But this guy has delivered in this situation plenty of times before. Looking for his first hit of this series and fouls it off. By the way, they did not call it a sacrifice, that swinging number before, if you're scoring at home. And actually, we do know that some of you are. So 0 for 4 yesterday, 0 for 2 today. Alonzo has been on it, just not that at bat at these two games, but there was a chance to give his team some breathing room. Now it's up to Benito Santiago. 38 years young. Fisted. Pavano calling for it himself. And Lee and Pavano collide. Lee makes the grab, but Pavano does the job to keep it a one-run game. San Francisco the Giants got one but they were looking for much more and Carl Pavano did the job on the mound he and uh, and Lee were like uh, guys going up for a rebound here on the mound Sut was well, Pavano's ball I mean he's there he, he says I got it he throws his arms out it, if an infielder can get there and get set well then the pitcher's got to get out of the way but that was a difficult play in the Marlins they really got fortunate so now both starting pitchers can hit for it. They're gone. This is Super Joe Nathan on the mound for San Francisco as we start the sixth inning. Look at all those wins. Good luck charm. Timing. Between he and Felix Rodriguez who always has eight, nine, ten wins out of the pen. They've, I don't want to say vultured, but it, it, those are pretty, <laughs> that's a, right? They're pretty nice records out of the yeah. bullpen. As uh, Miguel Cabrera up. I mean, think of this out of the pen, Tony, and set. Did he go? Yes, he's punched out by Brian Gorman. Midlife Glimpse Snoopy 2 has teamed up with ESPN to provide the aerial views of today's game and the surrounding Bay Area. Great shots that they are. 68,000 cubic feet of helium. That ought to be worth a few laps and measures 130 feet in length from nose to tail. Well, we thank the guys up there. Here's the shot safely away from the lights one incarnation but here Tony just to complete the thought here you know gave you Nathan's uh, mark at 12 and 4 and Felix Rodriguez 8 and 2 last year won eight games the year before he won nine games even Worrell the closers won four I mean that's a lot of wins out of the pen yeah it is it tells is. you what they're doing in close games yeah late, right? a lot of close games and they're coming in late and offensively they've been able to put runs on the board these guys have benefited from it <laughs> I think Joe Nathan's found a friend in Brian Gorman down at first base. And that's a strike, he says. I agree with both of them. Take a look at the swing here. Well out in front. You can see the hand even in front of home plate along with the barrel of the bat. The Giants 28 and 11 this year in one run ball games as we have now. 21 and 3 Boomer at home. One of one to Encarnacion. Top for a ball. Joe Nathan, the uh, pride of Division Three, SUNY Stony Brook. State University of New York, Stony Brook. And took them to the Division Three World Series. But Encarnacion sends it back, 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 back. And he's the pride of this game. We're tied again. I can't tell you how impressive this guy's been. We've, we've been fortunate, but we've seen him coming down the stretch the last three weeks of the season, and he makes the big play with the glove. 
He's hit some timely home runs like he just like he just did. And that's what he's going to hit it with. Look where Benito wanted to pitch. That's his power is the hanging breaking ball. And that little pause that he has there is the thing that a lot of opposing teams don't like a whole lot. He's not a real popular guy with the opposing team because of that little thing. But he's pretty popular in his own dugout right now. Oh, yeah. People in the state of Florida are pretty happy right now. And it's a Wednesday, so Jeff Conine, if we're watching him on Wednesday, he comes through with a base hit. So all of a sudden, these scrappy Marlins are showing you why, Bob Carpenter. They came into the playoffs on a roll. Yeah, they did, Chris. And, you know, before they took the field for their clincher last Friday night, I was down there with Buck Martinez and Kyle Peterson. They're high-fiving, low-fiving in the dugout. But let me tell you guys something. When Carl Pavano got that other pop-up a few minutes ago, the reaction was about the same as it was on Encarnacion's home run. This is a dugout that's together. They have different handshakes for different situations. And Tony talked about the state of Florida. Yeah, they're pretty happy right now. They've sold 53,000 tickets for Friday's game and 45 more in advance of the game on Saturday. Which is pretty good when they told us, Tony, down there that the sellout was 36,000. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but we could put 60 in there if we had to. I love that. <laughs> Wow, this is, uh, you guys had six, four. I mean, we're only in the sixth inning, and the Giants pen, which you would think would be advantage Giants, Giants pen versus Marlins pen, wouldn't you? If you, if you would. handicap I, I think so. I think so. Not. Both, both pens have obviously officially now scuffled. It's not like Nathan's coming in throwing you know, 83, 84 miles an hour. I mean, he's gotten his fastball up to 94 already this inning, but... The hanging breaking ball to Encarnacion, and he takes him deep. Conan hits the first pitch he sees in the hole for a base hit. And the Marlins are doing like they did all September. They're scrapping right now. Crowd stunned. And now you go back to those two at-bats. Yeah. For Pavano against Alfonso and Santiago. It was either the game was going to be really difficult for Florida or we were going to go down to the wire. Well, you'd see in the ladder. Conine, not your typical scatty Marlin, but Nathan keeping an eye on him because once a Marlin means that all of a sudden you're faster, right? Well, because, you know, there, there's always a possibility of that hit and run. Yeah. It's a hitter's count right now, and we've seen already, Boomer, in, 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 in all of the games thus far in the postseason, aggressive base running has, has made the difference. That's how the Twins took it to the Yankees yesterday. Here's a pick he needs to make to Alex Gonzalez, the shortstop. Guillen giving the signs over third always uh, one of the more fun players to watch play and be around when he played for years with the White Sox. Easy to guess what the sign Benito is going to put down is. I mean he's, he's still chasing that breaking ball Tony. Yep. That's what he should be putting down. And they seem so concerned with Conine at first base that. I'd like to see him get aggressive again here if you're Jack McKeon. Put on that hit and run. Try to help your hitter to stay on the baseball. Put something in play. You're going to pinch it for the pitcher in this situation. You get a first and third. Sharply hit the center on. Coming is Grissom. He short hops it. And so a base hit for Gonzalez. Three hits in a row for the Marlins. Near in business. There's that breaking ball. You see, he almost got it where he wanted, but he kept it on the plate. Benito wanted it off the plate where it was in Gonzalez's last at bat when he struck out. Pretty good piece of hitting there by a guy that has been struggling with that pitch. It was, and, and Marquise Grissom made a nice backhand short hop pick of that base hit. He, that's a tough play to make on the dead run, and he made it look easy. And now, all of a sudden, here the Marlins are taking a big sigh of relief being able to get out of that last half inning and now they're they've tied the game up and now they're looking to take the lead well they pinch it in this spot before and hollandsworth delivered and now the man with the most pinch hits in the history of major league baseball lenny harris began the year with the cubs you see his regular season numbers certainly not impressive but the art of pinch hitting he understands that and he's up with conine at second gonzalez at first Encarnacion is earlier homer to tie it at five. And 
Santiago and Nathan want to talk it over. Double barrel action in the Giants bullpen. Heard you up. I believe that's Christensen down there. And looks like for Florida is that the Fox up again, Chad Fox. So there's there's of course the bullpen's out here at Pack Valley. You almost might as well have a conversation with the fan. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you're right. I mean, that's right there, like the old time. So here is Lenny Harris. Way ball one. Both managers know they can empty those bullpens this afternoon. These two teams with an off day tomorrow, travel day to Miami. 31 more than Manny Mota. I didn't realize he had pulled that far away from Manny and Smokey Burgess on that list. Oh, this is ripped to right center field, and it's going to plunk in there. Conan had to hold. Here comes the throw in. So base is loaded. And up comes the super dangerous Juan Pierre. Four straight hits for Florida. Felipe Alou to the mound. And now it's the Marlins that have the bases loaded with a chance to change this game. Don't you dare leave. Welcome back to San Francisco. Chris Berman, Tony Gwynn, Rick Sutcliffe in a uh, totally different game two. Uh, of this uh, NLDS between the Giants and the Marlins. Four straight hits from Florida, starting with Encarnacion's home run, has tied this game at five. There's bases loaded now. And Jason Christensen, the lefty, will be the new pitcher for San Francisco. Let's go back down to Bob Carpenter and Lenny Harris doing uh, what he's done his whole career. He's been doing it for a long time, Chris, and around the cage today at about noon, Lenny walked up with his bat and said to Jack McKeon, you got to get me a hack today. I got to get in there. And Jack said, you know, a lot of guys can hit at noon. We'll see what happens after 1 o'clock. <laughs> and in Lenny Harris's case, guys, you know it only takes one swing for him. Big hit, Carpy, that's for sure, as the bases are loaded. And here is Jason Christensen, who really is not the pitcher quite yet. He's pitched well down the stretch, but a year and a half really arm trouble uh, and been out. Uh, and you can see the ERA. It's a half of it's been a work in progress pitching in games that aren't that close. Obviously, this is a different situation, Sut. It's really an amazing comeback for him off of Tommy John surgery. He's got some postseason experience, but what a difficult spot, Tony. I mean, yep. you got a guy at home plate that doesn't strike out, and he doesn't ground into many double plays. Yeah, and you know, and he could bunt, he could slash. There's all kind of possibilities here. You know, we saw him hit the hole between first and second in his last at bat. So here is Pierre, and he does look to bunt. Doesn't get that done. So strike one. <laughs> that was unusual. <laughs> one ball, the up throwing in another ball. It's the old way. Yeah, Benito picked it, and he thought he'd get away with throwing it back out, not knowing that Bill Miller, the home plate umpire behind him, was sending one out there to Christensen. There you go. There is balls on the ground. I need another ball. Now look at this. <laughs> Day. One strike and 200 hitman Juan Pierre, who is two for three and has scored twice. Oh, he hits this down the line. Cruz got a long way to go. He stumbles. And it bounces up again. The Florida Marlins are rolling here towards the plate. Cruz looked like he might have had a shot. He stumbled in the corner. And two runs have scored, and Florida has a 7-5 lead. Wow. Should have been just a sacrifice fly. I mean, that's a difficult play to make. Tony, you would know better than me. Yep. The wind's blowing. I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the mind of Cruz right now. Yeah, Cruz gets over there, and he gets his, he gets his feet tangled up. And his ball lands fair, and he doesn't know where it is. But explain to me why Lenny Harris was tagging think, on that ball. I think Lenny Harris was tagging on that ball because he felt like Cruz was going to make the play, and then he could he could tag up and go to second. The Marlins have battled back with a three, and they're not done. Yeah, the wind is blowing left and right, and Cruz normally makes the play, doesn't, and Florida's got a 7-5 lead. Matt Hurgis, a 
July acquisition from the San Diego Padres by these Giants. Now in with two runners in scoring position and the dangerous Luis Castillo at the plate. Steal one for three today. Infield in. Hayden ball in there for a strike for Hurgis. You always have to think about the bunt with the top two guys yep. in the order that you talked about in the open, Tony, for Florida. Well, how about the open? The top two guys with four hits and Castillo yep. up trying for a fifth. Also four RBIs and looking to add to that total. Mm. Fastball up top as Castillo swings through its 0 2. And the Giants are playing the infield in. And one thing these guys at the top usually do is put the bat on the ball, but he threw that fastball right by Castillo. Went up the ladder a little bit. Big curveball, above average change, and some velocity with Hurgis on the mound. Yeah, this is a big at bat for the Marlins. And we'd like to get something and elevate it and possibly get another run home without having to get a hit. Hit would be great. Hit would be two runs, but you, you'd get you'd take another run for out right here. Everybody in for the Giants for this one two pitch. Missed it. Center. Grissom coming on. Here comes the throw home. Double play. The gambling Marlins on a short fly ball said Harris home. Grissom was equal to the task. Santiago put the tag on. Yikes. Welcome back to San Francisco where Marquise Grissom how often do you see it you make a big defensive play you come up to the plate he fouls off the first pitch here in the bottom of the sixth inning for the Giants and Chad Fox is now the relief pitcher chopped it short Gonzalez over to Lee Grissom is gone guys Lenny Harris is not Juan Pierre or Castillo Are you surprised that he tagging the ball this short with Rodriguez coming up next Tony I don't know how you feel about this but I agree with being aggressive but you also have to know the situation and the situation there was the fact that Hud Rodriguez was in the on deck circle he has hit 375 with runners in scoring position this year you take that opportunity away from absolutely him. I totally agree with you Cruz hits the ball to right and Carnacion is there, and there's two outs. I mean, there is just no doubt that Grissom is coming in on this ball. You know, he's one go glove. He's one go gloves out there. We know he can throw, and I'm not going to take the bat out of Rodriguez's hand. I'm 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 going to give him a chance to get a two out hit and drive in not one but two runs. Lenny's the pinch hitting champ, not the stolen base yeah. champ. <laughs> it's a nice job of pinch hitting by Lenny Harris, but I mean he's a sitting duck from where Grissom released that ball from. As far as throwing him out at the plate. This game has been all about pinch hitters. Well, and here's another one right now in the nine hole hitting for uh, Burgess is Jeffrey Hammonds. Yeah, he used to be a pretty good player. All the Orioles and a bit of Colorado and trying to get back to it. He's Triple-A for a lot of the year with the Giants. We brought him up in the middle of the season, and he gets this one back into Pudge again. I think Pudge can use that off day more than the bullpen of the Florida Marlins. We saw him take one off his knee. We've seen him block numerous balls in the dirt. Mm. Now how about one off? How come you never caught, Tony? Well, I was smart enough to know I couldn't. One, being left-handed, but two, I, I, I was kind of a wimpy. I didn't like getting beat up like these poor guys do. Yeah, the ball got loose in the bullpen, and so that was a no pitch. Nobody saw that ball get I loose. I don't know that being a wimp means, I mean, catching's a tough deal. <laughs> I know. I, 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 hey, I hated pain. I, I never played tackle football. My dad used to bust my chops. Catching's a hard gig, and these guys, the guys like Pudge, you can 
get back there and do the things that they do, throw the ball, block balls. They take a beating over the course of a season. And, you know, this, you feel fortunate to get to this point. Little number by Hammonds. Fox over to Lee. And heaven forbid a one, two, three inning. So we have played six by the Bay, seven, five, Florida. The flotilla has been quieted by the Florida Marlins who in a uh, two inning span had six runs on nine hits to change the entire complexion of this game. They lead at seven five and what you have now is Fee Rod pitching to I Rod. Felix Rodriguez to Pudge Rodriguez and this one uh oh that's Cruz's danger zone. This time he makes a beautiful catch. He skidded out there the last time. By this time, made no mistake. Pudge goes, I wanted you to, to skid there again. That's his, that's exactly where he tripped on Pierre's fly ball. And this is a nice play. A couple of steps on that warning track, so you know you're getting close, but he had himself in good position, made a great play. And you know he's thinking about that fly ball to right field that he lost his balance on and fell down. And yeah, he makes that play on me. Yep. <laughs> and that's what Pudge is thinking about. How can he catch that ball? Right. I like, I like the spirit on the bench. Hey, great job. It was an Albert. Great job. Yep. Great job. Hey, Pudge is smiling. And, and you've got to give Jack McKean and his staff a lot of credit for that because, Boomer, they had that same attitude when we went into the clubhouse before the game. They weren't nervous. They, they weren't quiet. They were playing cards. They were laughing. I mean, Jeff Conine was saying we're going up against Shrek today. That's what, that's what he called his former teammate, Ponson. And then he corrected himself. He goes, well, now that he's been knighted, it, it, it was sure Shrek. Right. I mean, they're, they're, having a, they're having a blast. He was knighted. We didn't get to that story, but Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, knight in order of Dutch royal house in April. He's from Aruba, is Ponson. And... Uh, that's a protectorate of the Netherlands. So he is benighted. Meanwhile, Lee with a base hit to left. With one out. Cabrera coming up. Tomorrow, baseball. We got two games yet to go tonight. Baseball tonight at 3.30. And then game two of the Boston-Oakland series across the bay at 4 Eastern. One out here on the West Coast. And the Fox with the Swing Yankees. Game two. Tomorrow night's baseball. Don't forget, we have two games left this afternoon. The one across the bay is the nightcap, if you will. Red Sox and Pedro against Hudson and the A's, and of course, Cubs and Braves coming up after us. Nine plus hours of baseball here. I'd say that's a, that's a good afternoon and evening. You know, as devastated as they could have been after the dominating performance by Jason Schmidt yesterday. They they know if they can beat Ponson, which they have thus far today, they've got Reeder and Jerome Williams. They might not even have to deal with Jason Schmidt again to advance to where they want to be at that next level. And I think when we were down there today, they on, on the Marlins side, they felt extremely confident that they just weren't going to be overmatched like they were yesterday. So the chances of them being able to put the bat on the ball were a whole lot better today. And I think that's why they were so confident. Hey, look, let's backtrack in this game a little bit. Giants get three runs to go ahead 4-1 for Sidney Ponson, who promptly coughed up a three spot. Couldn't hold it in the fifth inning. He was pinch hit for and gone, and Florida continued the assault with three more in the sixth. But the guy you're looking for be stud-like, if you will. I mean, look, Florida didn't get here by accident, but 4-1 lead immediately. Yep. Didn't even have a chance to have this team sit on the lead for an inning or two. Nope. Fight for these Marlins. Well, Derek Lee has been at first base and he's looking like he wants yeah. to go over there. Yep. Most stolen bases in the majors by far by a first baseman. Ten more than Jeff Bagley. Tony, that's a great point about putting it in play. Yesterday against Smith, they had struck out four times the first time through the lineup. They're going through the lineup for the fourth time here this afternoon and only four strikeouts yep. total. Yep. 13 hits. You know, and that's what velocity does when you're facing a guy who has velocity 
guys are more apt to be out in front. They want to go get the ball instead of letting the ball come to them. But when you're facing a guy who doesn't throw as hard, and in the big leagues, 92-93 isn't as hard as 97-98, you're going to feel a whole lot more confident you can put the bat on the bat. Cabrera through the wickets of snow down in the bullpen area. Lee to third being held up by Guillen to throw to second. Didn't get him. Got to go as an error. Yes. I have never seen that ever by him. So here's Cruz and Wright and Snow admittedly two couple plays. That... Yikes. You know, that's a ball that 100 times out of 100, he's going to field it. It's just, uh, just that simple. And when my jaw dropped, I'll be honest, he is the best defensive first baseman, so you just don't see that very often. I think there's about 40,000 other people <laughs> that dropped their jaws. Yeah. It got awful quiet, Boomer. It did, and you're right, 100 out of 100, JT with all those gold gloves. I mean, it was a smash. I mean, let's not yeah, take anything away from Cabrera. But now the intentional walk to Encarnacion, who started uh, the last inning uprising, the five straight hits with a home run. So he'll be walked, and that'll bring up Jeff Conine, Mr. Wednesday. You've heard of Mr. October, You're right? This yep. is Mr. Wednesday. He's two for three, two runs scored. Here it is again, and it's through the five hole. Shot in the goal. You know, maybe being right on that little cutout right there, maybe that threw him a little bit, but that's normally a ball he comes up with. Yeah. To the mound goes Dave Rigetti, Jim Bulldog Brower pitching in the pen. A little note here by the Marlins, all right? They were shut out three times in September. Once by the Phillies, twice by the Braves. The next games, they won 11-4, 6-5, 6-3. They do not believe in negative momentum. And they're doing showing that again today. Like, that was yesterday, let's go. I think the other thing about this club, this Marlins club, they're versatile. I mean, this is... It might be the most versatile team offensively in the National League in the sense that they can beat you with their legs, they can beat you with speed, they can play the short game, they can get balls out of the ballpark, they can beat you with good defense, good pitching. I mean, they, there's a lot of ways that this team can, can put runs on the board or keep you from putting runs on the board. The word has been given to Felix Rodriguez and how to pitch to Conine, and he starts with a ball. Well, it surprised me, Encarnacion, with that intentional base on ball. That guy is not the hitter with runners in scoring position that Conine has been throughout his career. Just 262 for Encarnacion in those situations. You take a couple of shots up and in, something good might have happened. You got a guy that collectively has 95 RBIs this year. He's a 287 career hitter. Well, they're figuring maybe Encarnacion doesn't run like the wind and Conine possibly double up. I mean, that's obviously the strategy, whether it works or not. That's why we're here. Well, the thing that makes Conine good in this situation is he's not afraid to go the other way. So. Like that. Mm -hmm. Trying to. Bob Carpenter. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Recently, Bill Robinson and Jeff Conine made an adjustment not to his swing, but to his stance. He picks his front foot up. He puts it down earlier in the swing than he ever did before. It gives him better balance. His timing has been better. And Robbie says he can have an ugly swing, but right now the footwork is flawless. Mm -hmm. Well, and he's going back to get, it was the bat that, that Robert Redford got in the natural. He went back to change bats. A wonder something. Wonder, a wonder boy. boy, right? Yeah. In fact, to get maybe for him and the Marlins, they hope a lucky bat. Well, what Bob Carpenter was talking about now, he's he's concentrating on getting his foot down early so that he can get a better look at seeing the baseball. And sometimes in doing that, your swing isn't very beautiful, but it's very efficient in being able to put the bat on the ball. And we saw him do this yesterday where he hit the hole between first and second. 
getting his foot down early and letting that ball travel a little bit and then just carving it the other way. Reaches out to Snow. Aurelia back to Felix, not in time. Conine beats it out, and Lee scores in another run on the board, 8-5. Another little in-between hop coming at JT. He actually looked like he, he was worried about catching this baseball. There's the foot down. You can see, Tony, his, his head had stayed still. Now all he had to do is put the bat on the ball. As you mentioned, going the other way. But look how cautious JT was with that. He didn't want to hit the runner with the throw. And because of it, Conine with time to pick up a ribby. Well, Conine doesn't feel real good about that swing he just took. But, you know, he got an insurance run in. He stayed out of the double play. Cabrera is at third for the shortstop Alex Gonzalez. JT Snow. Uh, I'm just wondering if those shadows have anything maybe. to do with with his his problem seeing the baseball. Good point, Sut. And there's just one part of the field right now that that, that that has shade. And take a look at it. It's it's where J.T. Snow is supposed to perform. Well, I think that's a good point, Sut. That, that, that could exactly be what happened. Of course, Sun's hardly been out all day also. So. Tony, you know what it's like to try to hit off of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not making excuses for. Him. I mean, that's an error. But well, yeah, but I, that, gee, I, I'm I'm still in. I'm stunned. I think a lot of us, a lot of people here are inside the Gonzalez. And, well, there's you talk about how quickly this playing field is changing today. You're in the, the Neil Young out of the dark and into the black. Very difficult out there. Giants trying to keep this as an 8-5 game. In there for a strike to Gonzalez. Dontrell Willis. That's at least the third time mm -hmm. they've had him up. Well, he's got a lot of his friends here. Went to high school across the bay at Alameda. Played baseball at Pop Stargell Field. And they have a chance to pitch here. Way is Felix Rodriguez. Three and one to Alex Gonzalez. Rip to center. Grissom makes the grab. But not until those Marlins pile another run on. We head to the seventh inning stretch in San Francisco, 8-5 Florida. Well, we've just said God bless America, and now it's uh, take me out to the ball game, and the Giants need to take me back to the bat rack because the Marlins has just lifted off here in the middle innings in this game, and they lead at 8-5. Game is the copyrighted telecast presented by the authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball. May not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and description of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Ultimate World Series Pass. Major League Baseball is giving away World Series tickets for life. That's great. And other great prizes. Winning hologram numbers will be announced during games one through four of this year's World Series. Visit your neighborhood Radio Shack store for your chance to win. I think the crowd here is stunned a little bit, boys. Ponson with a 4-1 lead. Seems like a long time ago. That's what stunned them right there. I, I totally agree. You hand him that lead with all of the things that they have done to get him. That's supposed to be game over. Hand it to, to somebody in the eighth inning, maybe. Right. He couldn't even get through the fifth inning. And as a result, the Marlins got their hitting shoes on and running shoes on and continue. And now the crowd coming to life again here at Pac Bell. They think the Giants have more spunk. So Chad Fox, who would have been pinch hit for by Andy Fox. I look as a good Fox has been a bad day. Andy Fox in the on deck circle, but the third out was made. So Chad Fox will continue to hurl here 
in inning number seven. Durham, Snow, Aurelia with Bonds to follow. You know, we've talked already, Boomer, about the terrific job, again, that General Manager Brian Sabian has done for these Giants. We cannot forget about what Larry Beinfest, the general manager of the Marlins, has done. They all of a sudden, they had to make up their mind, are, 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 are we buyers or are we sellers? Right. With Mike Lowell, they didn't know what they were going to do. He didn't know. They decided to hang on to him. All of a sudden, with McKeon, they got back into the race, and then they added guys like Conine and like Fox on the mound now. And just thinking back here as Ray Durham is one for two of the walk, scored a run. You know, I, we happen to do that 97 series. I know those are other teams and other times. The Marlins and the Giants. Game one was 2-1, Florida won. This game one was 2-0. Game two in that series was 7-6, Florida. This game is 8-5. So even though the cast has changed, the plot remains the same. There you go. Yesterday and today. Two different ball games when you don't have the number ones, huh, boys? And Fox punches out Durham, who doesn't like it, but there's one out here in the Giants' seven. You know, Felipe was telling us, Tony, before the game that, that Cindy Ponson was a number one. He admitted yesterday that, that Smith was better. He was a one and a half, but... I, I didn't see number one stuff out of Ponson today. Again, he has not won a ga game in over a month. This is why, I'm telling you, this is why there was that question, which Ponson eventually started, but do we pitch Kirk Reeder? Yep. Because you know what you're going to get with Reeder. You're not sure with Ponson. Now, you say that, you don't know. And they figure Reeder will, the, end, the ultimate thinking was Ponson to put the hammer down and Reeder in the Florida's park where there'll be more guys that chest are out, puffed out a little more, might do a better job of holding runners on, etc. And he's been a veteran. But now you know why that was up in the yeah. air during our game yesterday. They they weren't sure what they were going to get, and I think they're still not sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think we I think everybody had the sense before this game started today that it, it was going to be this kind of game. All of a sudden, the Giants have gone quiet as Chad Fox has come in and retired five in a row. And the Marlins, the Marlins bullpen has done a great job here today. And good pitch by Fox. Well, you go back to Pavano, though. They weren't great pitches yeah. that he made to Alfonso and Benito, yep. but the results were terrific for Florida. Yep. That That's the key in it, where you had for bases loaded and one out. And now we're really up showing bunt and big picture here if they could get it really they have bonds to lead off down by at least three the next inning that's that's when you pitch that's to them. that's when you yeah you don't mind pitching to them then getting the first two outs of this inning it's not as bad even if Aurelia gets on and they have to pitch to him now yep. because of the unearned run Florida scored in the top of the seventh. They just keep putting them up. Now there's three in the fifth, three in the sixth. There's one in the seventh. That pitch Aurelia thought was up high, but Bill Miller said it's a strike and it's one and two. And I know back when I played, that would be a ball. How long ago did you play? Yeah, not that long, long ago. Come on. Time ago. <laughs> Aurelia reaches out, slow grounder to Gonzalez. To lead. Bounds will lead off the eighth for the Giants, but the big problem is they trail it eight to five. Well, yeah. Top of the eighth inning, and the Marlins lead the Giants eight to five in a stunned Pack Bell Park. The Giants led at one point in this game going into the fifth, four to one. But it became unraveled. Ponson couldn't hold it. The bullpen coughed it up. And now Jim Brower will be on the pitch. We've seen Ponson, Nathan, Christensen, Purgis, Felix Rodriguez, and now Brower. It hadn't mattered to the Florida Marlins. Didn't matter who Felipe Alou put their, out there on the mound. They continue to get base hits. They continue to put runs up on the board. They continue to gain more confidence in this series. 
This is a pinch hitter now for the Marlins. Brian Banks hitting for Chad Fox, who is six up, six down, 17 pitches. You don't see relievers go three. I'm not suggesting that you have an off day with the economical pitches. Would you now? Nah. Would you think about pitching in the third inning, son? I think Looper and Urbina both need an inning today. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reason he's making that move, along with trying to increase this lead. Banks fouls this back. And Tony, you can relate to this better. I mean, Banks needs to see some live pitching, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you, you'd like to go to the, you know, give your bench a shot. But here we are, we're in the top of the eighth inning, and I would agree with everything you guys have said, except the guy walking down there to the bullpen is Urbina. And Banks hits this one to right. Back goes Cruz, back he goes, and he makes the catch. Another anxious moment down there, but Banks, the pinch hitter, does a good job. It flies out a long way. He thought he got it. I thought he did, too. There it is. This is fun. All right, boys. There's the ninth run. No, wait a minute. There's some wind up there. You know, like we talked about before the game started, you know, the guys at the top of the lineup kind of set the tone. And these guys, Pierre and Castillo today, Castillo today, they have set the tone. Well, Pierre. Three for four, Castillo one for four. Pierre, can you point out the uh, three ribbies? Four ribbies. Now this guy right here, Pierre, he's been right in the thick of it. RBI single. The fly ball which turned into a double. And this is what a lot of teams like to do. They like to bust him in. He showed them that he can pull pull the ball too. Here they are. Four RBIs and four for eight for these fellas. What a change for 0 for 4 and 0 for 4, huh? An excuse me swing. Aurelia out. Grissom in, neither can get it. So four hits for the 200 hit man Juan Pierre. Carl Ravitch trying to top that. I'll do my best, Boomer. So will Gary Sheffield. You see what he's done. 132 RBIs this season. Trying to get the Cubs away from a 2 0 lead. Even this thing up before they go to Chicago. It's Cubville in Atlanta. But Stunville here in San Francisco. I just the crowd has just just been it's been shocked. They've been shocked by the pitching, been shocked by a couple of fielding miscues, and shocked by all of a sudden five runs on just six hits versus eight runs and 14 hits for the Marlins. First pitch or second pitch? I don't think it's going to take long. I, I think <laughs> Castillo's looking to hit that hole between first and second. Been in this number two spot a lot, Tony. I yeah. mean, if he's going to run like this, you got Alan Wiggins out there. If it's a fastball, do you swing and try to protect? If I if I can, out of the corner of my eye, I used to see if he got a good enough jump. And you get to playoff baseball, a lot of times you better be ready to swing. There he goes, little chopper. So Durham has to go over to Snow. He obviously easy in the second base, two out. And he tried right there to take that ball away and hook it into the hole and he kind of got it off the end of the bat but you know they're kind of they're they're kind of acknowledging each other Pierre broke Durham held his ground this time he didn't try to cover and as you see Durham take a couple of little baby steps towards second base Let's go, and so you knew that they had hit and run on their mind because Pierre's trying to open up a hole for Castilla. Jack McKeon said this morning that uh, Castilla's gotten 15 to 20 hits playing hit and run with those with those two guys at the top of the lineup. Jack said they all got the green light too. 
I'm not holding any of them. You said use a little bit of intelligence, but that's that's what he did from mm -hmm. day one when he got here. He, he told him, don't be afraid to gamble. I'm not, I don't have a shotgun with me here in the dugout. We'll talk about it if it didn't work. Talk about the body language in the ball clubs as Pudge Rodriguez is up. I'm going to show you the two respective dugouts, all right? Here's, here's the Florida dugout, all right? They're all on their feet, leaning over the rail like little kids, like they can't wait to get free candy or something. Right now, look at the Giants. There's you know, three or four or five over the rail, half dozen sitting, more sitting deep underneath, and just a. Uh, you can guess who's up eight to five, can't you? Well, yeah, nobody's sitting for Florida, right? There they are, and there are the Giants. You know that feeling, both of you guys. Yep. You also know that feeling of having a lead and letting it get away. Mm -hmm. And I think on both sides, the Marlins realized that, uh, you know, they needed to get things going offensively, which they've done. I think right along with going into today's ball game hoping to win they're going to go into the game Friday expecting to win yep. and they have Redmond and Willis to pitch in Florida against Kurt Reeder and the rookie from Honolulu Jerome Williams in front of well we already heard Carpy say 53,000 so far sold for Friday that'll be a Dolphins home game won't it by the time they get done selling those tickets <laughs> we'll be there three of us Miss with that one. Three and one. And Pudge Rodriguez wouldn't mind driving in tonight. Florida run. Just off the outside corner here, trying to get it expanded. The crowd finally with an opportunity to voice some of their frustration with what's gone on here. Side, Pudge's walk. He's aboard for the second time today. I like what Juan Pierre did there, Tony, by by just standing still. I mean, he gave Pudge an opportunity to drive in that run. Now on the first or second pitch, I, I look for him to take off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some hitters, certain hitters don't like runners bouncing around out there with two outs. You know, you want to kind of give them an opportunity to swing the bat, uh, especially later on in the count. You know. Um, but early in the count here, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see both of these guys on their move, on the move. Plus, you've got that right-handed hitter in the box, which makes it more difficult for a catcher to throw down yep. that third base line. Especially this right-handed hitter being 6'5". Chops that foul. They're moving. And that's Florida's game. Yep. They've got to stay aggressive on the base pads. End it with two on. Give his team a chance. He's inside. We should remind you that uh, all the baseball postgame press conferences, this game and later on tonight on ESPN News after all three games today to be seen here on ESPN. Here goes Pierre. There goes the ball to center. Grissom drops it, boots it over to Cruz. Pierre scores, punch to third, and it's just become unraveling for the San Francisco Giants. Felipe told all of us before the game today, he says, I've never seen so many balls misplayed by the opposing team. He talked about the dimension, the different angles. He talked about the wind and how you almost have to check the flag on every pitch, Tony, as opposed to every inning. But it, it's been just the opposite. It's yep. been the Giants. Yep. And this ball is a ball that it goes right into Grissom's glove. Looked like it hits him on the heel of the glove and just wouldn't stay. 
ricochets it over to Cruz out in right field. And Carnacion fouls it off. And Pierre just is bouncing around. He's going. Doesn't seem to bother Derek Lee at all. This ball's going away from Grissom. But that's a ball that he could catch. I think they scored that ahead, huh, fellas? I think they did. Oh, it's 15. Nothing official yet. But look, whether they... Giants made two errors yesterday. That can't be a hit. No, I know that. But the scoreboard has it as that right now. But two errors yesterday, error today, and then probably another one, and, and the crew's miscue out there. I mean, it's just been a difference of, you said they were two of the best fielding teams in baseball. The Giants have not done their part yeah. in these two games. Well, I, I, I think. I mean, they made some nice plays, Bonds has catch. Yeah. I mean, sure they have, but I think difference in this game, though, is the opportunities. With the two mm -hmm. pitchers yesterday, there just wasn't that many, right. you know? Schmidt just absolutely shut down the Marlins. Beckett pitched very well himself. And Carnacion made a couple of nice plays early. But for the most part, you have to give the pitchers the credit in game one. Cabrera strikes out. Florida comes up with another run. Let's see how good Bonds is. Could he hit a grand slam with nobody on? We're back, and Barry Bonds is up to the plate to lead off the eighth. The Giants trail at 9-5, and on the mound, the game four starter, the rookie sensation, the high kicking from across the bay, Dontrell Willis. And it's not often, guys, that your game four starter gets a dry run at a guy he's going to have to face four times in game two, right? Not very often. And conversely, Bonds gets a view of him. Rare makes the call a third. Bonds is out. And I'm sure a thrill. I mean, for Willis, they were all-star teammates. And I began the year at Zebulon, North Carolina. The Carolina Mudcats in double-A. He got the call. I, I asked, I said, well, what was it? Was it like the rookie? Was it like the movie? The rookie says, well, he called me in with a straight face, said, well, you got a promotion. So, well, I like Albuquerque, Pacific Coast League. You know, I'm from the Bay. But no, 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 you're not going to triple-A. You're going to the big show. And he said, and I called home. I left a message for my folks, and I couldn't get him. And no one really knew what it meant. You're going to the big show. And oh, he, his face lit up when he told the story this morning. Alfonso with a base hit that was needed earlier in the game. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I, I'm kind of surprised that with a four-run lead, you bring Willis in. I wouldn't want to give him a look. I wouldn't want the giant hitters uh -huh. to have a look at me in the league here. And it's, Why yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, want to want to see that first out that he got with Bonds in, in his start in, in yep. Game Four. Yep. I, and, and why is he still out there now? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I agree. He has thrown a lot of pitches. He, the first time he got up was about an hour and a half ago. Yep. I mean, that that's that's up four times. That's yep. that's abusing, uh, you know, a young arm as far as a day that he was just supposed to throw on the side is concerned. Yeah, because the pitches, I mean, we're not even counting the pitches he threw down there in the bullpen. And if he's going to start game four, I wouldn't give these guys a free look. I mean, it was in the fifth inning. They told him to get ready. If the bases were loaded, he was coming in to pitch the bond. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't loaded. They were first and third, so they intentionally passed him to load him up, and they told him to sit down. That's been a long time ago. This guy has thrown a lot of innings this year. He well, has, he, let alone pitching into the month of September, it's October now. Here's what it tells you how far the confidence as Santiago fists it back. Uh, how short on confidence they are right now in Braden Luke. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, he was the closer, Urbina is now, but do you bring in Luper with a four-run lead in the edge? Yeah, maybe not. That's I mean, great, he's throwing now. That's a great point, because you know, we were in Florida two weeks ago, and Luper was the closer. And then one week, one week later, it had flipped, and, and Urbina became the closer. Well, if you don't have confidence in him, like you said, Tony, why don't you let Fox exactly. hit and that's, send him back? That's what I, I totally agree with that. I, I'm kind of surprised he took Fox out. Santiago rips this to left, and that'll bound down there. Conan with a nice play to cut it off. Giants certainly aren't gambling. They need base runners, and guess what? They have two with one out, trailing 9-5. to five. Well, even though you're down four runs and you can't afford to make a mistake, I think 
That's a ball Alfonso could get the third on. I mean, this ball is hooking in the corner. And we saw how being aggressive on the bases made a huge difference for the Marlins. You know, Benito gets this ball out in front and hits it down the line. We're going to have a double switch. I think Tony McKeon out to talk to the home plate umpire, I would assume. And I believe we're going to see for the first time in this series and for the first time since the end of August. Is that Mike Lowell coming out there? So Mike Lowell's going to go to third. Cabrera, the third baseman, is out. I guess that's Looper coming in. Willis has faced three batters. He got Bonds, but gave up sharp base hits to Alfonso and Santiago. And maybe life in the Giants yet. So hold the phone. We're in the bottom of the eighth, and the wheels are spinning. Hi, sir. Bottom of the eighth. Giants down by four, and life in the crowd for the first time in about an hour and a half. And now, Ray Looper on the pitch. Willis is out. Grissom coming up. Two runners on. Braden Looper, the closer for most of the season, surrendered that role, as Tony mentioned, the last week to Urbina. Tony, I, I can kind of understand why he would have put Willis in there to face Bonds. I mean, we both talked with Dontrell before yesterday's game. He was in the upper deck here for the National League Championship Series watching games four and five. It had to be a thrill to come in. You know he's got a lot of family and friends here at the ballpark. But once that happened, once he faced Bonds, now you, the, the easy thing to do is to go get Looper. Looper had tremendous success against Alfonso and Benito, but he didn't face them, and they're on base. Yep. Mm -hmm. He comes into a ready-made jam already being forced to throw strikes. And a ball one to Marquise Christian. We saw Mike Lowell, his first action in the series, is uh, played the Sunday regular season finale. He'll hit in the nine spot, and the pitcher goes in Cabrera's spot, the five. Two and all. Oh. And now you're bringing a reliever who struggled with two runners on. Yeah. Right? And that's, you know, it's easy to look back. You know, but if Looper was struggling, I don't want to bring him in in a situation where there's already guys on. 3-0 to Grissom with Cruz on deck. Well now. Strike one, barely. Three-one pitch. Now Luther's worked it back to the full count. I'll tell you what changes here, though, is the baseball. He had a pretty good feel for that one on the last two pitches. Good and confident. This one might have a little higher seam. It might be just a little bit slicker. It might get away from him. Runners on the move. A slow bounder. Grissom can roll low. The ball finds you immediately, doesn't it? And throw over to Lee. And there's that out. The second out of the inning. That's a tough play, too, for him because you got the runner who's running on the pitch crossing in front of you on a ball that Grissom broke his bat on. This ball ran in on Grissom, and there's a the runner. He's going in front of you. He stays with it nicely. And you got the crowd going crazy. That's an adrenaline rush that Lowell hadn't had in a long, long time. This is making that play with the car looking at him. Cruz. With two men on, swings at the first pitch, and Looper has come in and done the job. Conine squeezes it in left. High five from Putz to Looper. It stays 9-5. Kawasaki. Top of the ninth here in San Francisco. The Giants uh, made a little run, but nothing to, uh, nothing hung up on the scoreboard. And so the Marlins enter the ninth with a four-run lead. Tim Worrell, the closer, who, of course, with a complete game of Jason Schmidt yesterday, pitched not at all. And in a 9-5 situation, is not used to pitch at this point. 
we should tell you deep and short is Aurelio over to snow and Juan Encarnacion is gone. We're still playing baseball here and those of you in Chicago and Atlanta will bring you the first pitch if you want to go over in Chicago to WGN if you want to go over in Atlanta to WUPA you'll see the beginning of your game on time Braves Cubs game two in Atlanta we'll stay here we've got the ninth to play and then immediately we'll bring the rest of the country out to John and Joe in Atlanta for Hampton and Zambrano here's Jeff Conine hopefully that's clear two for four and it's on Wednesday I mean it's automatic how about the Marlins I mean barring a major event here in the ninth inning and on that ball is Benito Santiago and Conine is gone how about what the Marlins have done and there's there's uh, pitcher coach Wayne Rosenthal and, and Don Trell Willis well it's been a total team effort he literally has used almost every one of his available pitchers. He's used just about everybody he had off the bench. And for the most part, for Jack McKee and Tony, they've all responded. Yeah, and you know what? I think the biggest boost, um, Brandon Looper probably got the biggest boost because he had been struggling. He came in, fell behind, got two outs, not a run scored. First guy out to shake his hand at the inning, Jack McKeon. And after the Giants had a 4-1 lead for Sidney Ponson in the fifth. It's been 8-1 Florida. Pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it really has been. What do you think that scene's going to be down there on Friday and Saturday, fellas? Fun. I, I, I would. Hot. Yeah, hot. <laughs> it's going to be fun. That's the one thing we can look for sure is it's going to be hot, but. I think it's going to be no. I guess it would be much like it was in '97. I wasn't there, but really on the grass, the snow, and they get Gonzalez. So the Giants, so they have four runs in the bottom of the ninth. We'll be back to see, but right now, the Carl Ravitch and Bobby Valentine, fellas. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much. Watch this game. Bottom of the ninth coming up. Boy, what a pitch on that 3-0 call that uh, Braden Looper got for him. Turning pitch of the day. He didn't look like he could throw it over. 3-0, strike one, turn the whole inning around. All right, folks. For most of you around the country, we'll certainly take you back out to see the bottom of the ninth between uh, the Giants and the game they're playing right now. And we'll also take those of you in Atlanta and Chicago to see the beginning of the Cubs-Braves game. John Miller and Joe Morgan will have the call of that one. The rest of the country will rejoin that after the bottom of the ninth in San Francisco. Enjoy the games. Now those of you watching the Giants again in a break. Bottom of the ninth coming up. See if San Francisco can muster a rally. Bobby and I will be here the rest of the night. Bottom of the ninth coming up after the break. Tonight at San Francisco the Marlins are three outs away from evening this thing at one and sending them home to what'll be a frenzied South Florida crowd. It's going to be true. The blimp navigating the skies of a Pac-12 park to provide aerial coverage of this afternoon's action. 68 horsepower engines enabling it to reach a maximum speed of 55 miles an hour, 7,000 feet. MetLife blimp, thank you very much for your participation for us this afternoon. Nafi Perez, an infielder that can play all the positions. Bat in the nine spot is the pinch hitter. And then the Giants will have the top of the order against get what you pay for Urbina. The new closer. Well, the new old Clay. He is a closer, but he's the new closer for the Marlins. <laughs> With the exception of Tejera, that's the only thing left down there in the Florida Marlins bullpen. We've had 14 pitchers used today, which uh, another division series has only been around less than a, a decade, but that ties the record there. We've seen game four starter pitch. Well, I know all my columns are full. I got yeah. no more room. Yeah. <laughs> Popped up by Perez. 
Gonzalez and Castillo a little invention and Gonzalez makes the play. The Marlins have made the play and the Giants have not. This is where Cruz got tangled up on the ball hit by Pierre on a play he normally makes. And this is right through the wicket to Snow. And then Marquise Grissom on a ball scored a hit in a long run. Just don't expect to see that from San Francisco. You know, I mean, uh, most of the time, all three of those guys are going to make plays, make the play. And on this particular day, they didn't. And each time they didn't make the play, the Marlins capitalized on it. And that's what they should do. And you want to look for other heroes in this game. For the Giants, with the, uh, with the sacks full, for Alfonso and Santiago in the fifth inning. A chance to change the game. With the lead. And yeah, had a lead still. Yeah. Right? With the lead. 5 4. Carl Pavano came in and did the job. And then Florida came through with their bats. In the late is Derek Lee. Now you know why they talk about him as a superb fielder. Over to Urbina. I, I just think it's remarkable, Boomer, how, how they've all responded here. You go back to Pavano. He's a starting pitcher. He comes in in relief, and, 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 and it, it might have been a good pitch to hit, but the result was what they were looking for. When he brought in Looper, he double switched. He put Mike Lowell out there, and he really didn't have to do that because the pitcher spot did not come up. He could have left Cabrera in there, who had been playing that position since Lowell was out. Lowell had some rust on him. They said it didn't look like it on the ground ball that was hit to him. All of the pinch hitters have come through. Now he puts Urbina out there. He could have run Looper back out in that situation. He decided not to do that, but guess what? Urbina got the job done again for Jack McKeon. Slow bounder, Snow. Now it's off his foot. The Marlins, okay, in their last nine regular season series, they never lost the first two games. Should I make it ten? They just they have a way. We told you about the shutouts. They came back always with a lot of runs. Yep. And certainly, the top of the order, Tony. Yep. Such came back in a big way with Pierre with four hits. Well, they're a good ball club, and Tony mentioned it. They have a lot of ways to manufacture runs offensively. Yeah, and that's what they did today. And an intentional walk for Jack McKeon below the bases this time was the proper move with those two at-bats that we talked about, right? But they're still up on the front end, aren't they? Top step Marlins. Fellas, I do believe that we're in for an interesting weekend in Florida. I, I agree. My bags are packed. Mine too. <laughs> Yours are here. You're getting out of here tonight, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get in that limo with Boomer and that police escort and go watch Pedro and Hudson. Okay, I got uh, the police escort might be car 54 that we're talking about. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not talking about them leading them. I'm talking about them chasing them. <laughs> Across the bay in uh, less than three hours, Red Sox Oakland game one. Pedro and Tim Hudson. You see that on ESPN later on. Juan Pierre camps under it. Snow is gone. And the Florida Marlins have won nine to five and have tied this NLDS at one game apiece. For all of us here, Bob Carpenter and Rick Sutcliffe and Tony Gwynn, I'm Chris Berman. Glad you enjoyed it. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Cubs, Braves, game two, all set in Atlanta. John Miller, Joe Morgan on the call. See you Friday afternoon. Now he tries to score and the throw. Oh, my God.